Let me uh, clean oh the my. lenses. Do a little zhuzh. Not They're so it. dirty. Can you tell? No. They're well, mine bad. are always filthy, so I feel like I can't really judge yours. I really do need new lens. I mean, these glasses. I like them, and I feel like people know me for these glasses at this point. But we got we got to change it up a little bit. My fingerprints are like stained into <laughs> it, basically. Are they like bent at all. Mine always end up being like slightly crooked. Yeah. Oh, I thought. Oh, actually, I, crazy. I think my ears are crooked. Mine, because- mine are off too. I think that's like a very normal thing because mine are off as well. I, I always look just disheveled, like I'm, like I'm a mess. Like, yeah, it always looks like someone hit you in the face. Like not yeah. you. I just mean like no. when your gla- glasses. You're right. Are you're right. Every and but my I think it's my face's fault, not my glasses fault. Because every time I put glasses on, I'm like, why are my yeah. glasses like? Mine that? do the same. Where one <laughs> eyebrow is lower. It, it, I think it's the ears. Also, like I have. I don't have a lazy eye, but I have a lazy eyelid, and so oh. like. It's we call it the Schultz eye because everyone on my dad's side has this. Oh, problem, that happens with my left eye. Like, remember when I wake up and I can't open this eye? That's me with this eye. I, I yeah. literally can't open this eye for like ten minutes. And for the rest of the day, I mean, just naturally, if you ever see me smile, this eye is always more closed. Yes, mine too. Why have, so wait, weird. we've talked about this because we call it the Kaiser eye. So clearly, it's, oh. a, it's a commonality between I, our families. I like that I is in Kaiser. That's more oh, fun Kaiser than the Kaiser eye. Yeah. I never thought about that. The Kaiser eyeser, you know? Yeah. Sometimes when you do those like flip photos, like on TikTok or whatever, oh. my eye, I'm like, why is one of my eyes like giant? Cause I don't, <laughs> I'm not used to it. And it's like, oh my God, I look like a freak. Uh, I feel the same way. I refute anytime I have to reverse a picture. I'm like, I'm going to fucking hate it's, how this it's goes. It's the worst. It's I'm awful. like I'm the ugliest person that ever lived. I think the same way. <laughs> anyway, welcome to that's why we drink. Just a <laughs> pair of two ugly people with weird fucking eyes. Oh just... no, you know the truth. We're actually really <laughs> ugly. Uh, everyone's like, yeah, we know. Okay, so we follow. That's you why on you have a voice for radio. <laughs> that's what they say. I always thought that was a compliment until I learned English better and went, oh, that's not very nice. Uh, <laughs> welcome to and that's why we drink. We are really attractive radio hosts here mm. to entertain you with some stories of yep. the macabre oh christine you are doing something different with your voice lately and i am not a, i'm not against it it's probably that i don't sleep much and then i drink too much coffee but you know if it's working I'll it's working it. yeah I'll keep not it. sleeping we'll just see okay. what happens it's not gonna be hard <laughs> but thank you <laughs> how, how are you christine oh i'm good i'm lovely em uh i'm wearing my uh vintage thing that i bought at a thrift store with eva in austin texas is a dinosaur t-shirt um oh nice. makes me really happy i just rediscovered it how are you good i'm wearing a shirt about blizzards so yes we are from wearing... 1993 right from 93 i survived the blizzard of 93 were Sorry. you alive yet? Yes. You yeah, were I was born, born in 92. 92. I don't it, know. You're always it, talking about how youthful you are. It didn't take much to survive it because I was a baby. So <laughs> yeah, or it took everything to survive it because you couldn't take care of yourself and okay, you had to depend on everyone else. But that's true. very impressive either way. Uh, why do you drink this week, Christine? <clears throat> well, um, um, I drink because I'm so thankful that everybody else understands my face washing struggles. I saw that. I'm glad that they feel it, it, it too. I knew it would, I knew, I was like, I feel like other people have to have this problem. Everybody, like estheticians, so many people reach out and are like, oh my God, this is like the worst part of skincare is washing your face. And then Emothy sent me like a video of them washing their face to be like, here, this is how you wash your face. And it was very like, you looked very annoyed. And I was like, I didn't tell you to make this video. Em. I had just woken up as it's, I was in the middle of wiping off my sleep skin. So yeah, you I'm going to be a little the camera annoyed. And you went here and like put it down and wash your face. I was like, what am I getting in the morning? What is this? Why are you sending me this so angrily? And also, by the way, it wasn't, this is how you wash your face. This is how I wash my face. Oh no, I'm I know. Sh- you I'm were basically sure I'm not like, doing this is either. how one does it properly. But like literally and put dial soap all over their face, like hand soap. And I was like, this I know is incorrect. Okay. And guess I, what I said? What did I say in the video? I said, I know this isn't right, but it's all I've got right now. So I just, just want to clarify because a lot of people were like, I can't believe you guys put hands. I was like, I don't put hand soap on my face. Just to clarify, that's M's doing. Um, it's I have facial, facial cleanser. I just don't properly use it. But, and then you grabbed a hand towel, put that on your face. I was like, I feel like all of this is just 
a hand to dry your face? Are you not supposed to blot your face with a nice dry well, towel? puts their hands on that. Don't you have like a washcloth? Or that something? was a cl- that was a clean one from the laundry. Oh, okay, I should have okay. given you context. Whew, I was like, that looks like you just took it off the public apartment bathroom and put it all over your face. Oh my god. Okay, I had, but it had also just been hung up. Like it had just been hung up. So okay, I didn't that made care. me feel a little better then. But um, yeah, I've I've uh, a lot of people say they do the sweatband method. They actually sell uh scrunchies that like terry cloth scrunchies to absorb water um but also i will say like uh, thank you for sending me that but i will say i understand the difference here which is that i feel like you'd kind of like blot water on your face but like i feel like i need to like scr- like wash i'm more about this i'm more about the um i don't know i all, well i also thought that my face is a, really close to the sink the whole time so maybe that's what's keeping the water from getting everywhere else like I really like kind of throw my face pretty close to the faucet. And I feel like maybe there's like a pool for you because maybe you're like higher up and like just I think whacking I just yourself use with more water. water. Maybe. I def I don't know. I have like, no idea. Is there still a film of soap on your face after you do that? Like it looked still. No, it was, it was, it was pr- pretty cleaned off. I, I really am like so gross about texture. So if anything felt soapy or okay. slippery or anything, it would have, I would have washed it off. Okay. Well, anyway, thank you for clarifying and thank you everyone for coming to my rescue. I'm glad it's not just me. Uh, the monsoon thing, a lot of people have resonated with a lot of people. Well, since um, you've mentioned it, I have been, I've been getting like TikTok uh-huh. algorithm videos. Yeah, you? there's TikToks. Uh, yeah, there's TikToks about, well, I mean, I always got those because I was like, oh. well, clearly this is a problem I've dealt with my whole life. I hadn't um, gotten it until we had that discussion. And all of a sudden, all of these videos on my TikTok were people talking about how they put scrunchies on to wash their face. And yeah. when you mentioned it, I had never heard of anyone doing that before. Yeah, I'm telling you, it's I opened the floodgates lit- quite literally, not even just <laughs> metaphorically. Um, so anyway, I'm very thankful. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, can I, okay, I don't know how the smoothest way to transition into this, but Emma and I wanted to take a brief moment, or do you want to say why you drink first before I get into the heavy stuff? uh no let's just say this is also why i drink this, okay i mean this is heavy primarily thing. yeah this is like the real reason i think pretty much everyone who listens yeah. is drinking but we did want to take a moment to address uh the what's been going on the, the shooting in atlanta and you know a couple people were wondering like why didn't you say anything and i just want to point out like i was traveling we didn't record last week so there was kind of a gap where we were uh off the air for the first yeah. time in a long time um, and so I, I want to point out that was not an intentional, like ignoring the situation. We just didn't record our episode was like, you know, from two years ago. Um, but we did want to say something. I know it's a little late now, but it's going to be hopefully relevant after this stops, quote unquote, trending. Yep. But so, you know, we're podcasters. We have a platform. Um, I think I, as a true crime podcaster, can't just brush something like this aside, even if we do consider ourselves like entertainers. And so, you know, obviously we want to, we want to talk about it. I mean, I typically do try to uh, make a concerted effort to bring in more stories that are diversified because a lot of times stories about crimes against people of color showcase the inequality, uh, the way, you know, police and media and podcasts handle, you know, crimes against white folks versus people of color. And now this is just becoming more and more to the forefront. So I'm going to, you know, personally, at least commit to, you know, continuing to do that and making it, you know, more of part of our weekly broadcast that that's brought up, um, you know, even once this falls off the media, what do you, whatever you call it, the media once it's not topical yeah Yeah. exactly exactly (laughs) and i know that's easier said than done but i i want you guys to keep me accountable for that you don't have to keep me accountable i have to keep myself accountable but feel free to obviously call me out if that's something that kind of ever trails off or i forget about Uh, i do want to also add some links in the show notes of places that i've found particularly helpful to kind of learn more to get involved Um, There are quite a few funds set up to help support victims' families. There are uh, fund efforts to combat hate crimes and increase protection and security for AAPI communities. And this, like, normally this is not something I would want to discuss, but there have been people reaching out asking, like, what specifically have I done uh, to help? And I want to, like, assure you this is very close to my heart, and I take all this very personally and seriously. Um, I've personally donated to the Asian Americans Advancing Justice Fund in Atlanta, which is doing a great job, a great thing for the local community, as well as the community action fund set up by hate is a virus. And like, obviously donating is just one little drop in the bucket compared to 
the whole bigger picture in general, mm. um, which again is why I'm hoping to keep the conversation going long <clears throat> into the show. And uh, finally, one site that I personally really am excited about that exists and I didn't know existed and that I've bookmarked and I recommend you bookmark is called stopaapihate.com. And that's where you can like personally report any hate incidents you see or come across. Um, There's obviously, as probably most of us know, there's been a spike in anti-AAPI hate incidents, xenophobia, et cetera, during COVID-19. And so if you are able to, you know, if you do witness something, I urge you to report it there. If you can monetarily contribute, great. Otherwise, you know, there are other ways you can commit your energy and time and, you know, learn more. And we'll put all that info in the show notes. Damn. I could have not said any of that better than we, we, we Uh, talked before the episode of like, yeah, we should definitely, you know, discuss this before the, before we get into our stories. And Christine was like, oh, I already have something totally prepared. So I was like, (laughs) shit. Okay, great. That's perfect. (laughs) Well, I felt that I, part of me, if, you know, sometimes I try to wing it or we, not this, but, you know, we try to wing like discussions and then every time without fail afterwards, we're like, oh shit, we should have said blank or we should have brought up blank. And it's just without fail where we get derailed and forget something. So I want to make sure I covered all the topics. No, it's a, it's a huge, important situation. I it mean, is. well done. I just wasn't expecting it to be that perfectly. <laughs> it's like, ha- it's like a on. third of my entire notes today are just that, wow. on that topic. Okay. Well, it's important. Uh, so I mean, it well is, done. it's, it's dar- deeply important, but obviously true crime related and true crime, you know, is one of those kind of controversial things because it's not just because it's, you know, it's entertainment. It's like, we get paid to do this and talk about kind of fucked up stories. And so they're, even though it's like, oh, well, it's just entertainment. Like, n- I don't see it that way. I feel like if you are broadcasting to a large number of people and you have a platform, especially telling real life stories about people's lives and people's families and victims, then you have, you're basically a journalist in a way you're telling. I mean, that's what I learned in journalism school is like, if you are sharing on a platform, real information, that is basically all you need to be labeled a journalist. So I think, um, I take it very seriously, making sure, you know, uh, we are very transparent and upfront. Um, and I, I felt really like kind of stuck because for the last week, uh, I've gotten a lot of tags and messages being like, why aren't you saying anything? And I was like, you know, there's only so much you can post on Instagram without like, looking you know, like you're not, performative or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. And like, I don't <clears throat> personally, I don't want to just keep posting on Instagram. It does. It doesn't feel like how I'm, it doesn't feel yeah, it's like different. I'm contributing it, as much. Well, it's also it's weird because to post something on Instagram feels performative, but it also lets people know that you're yes. aware of the situation and taking care of it. But then the things you're doing behind the scenes to actually be of help, right. no one's noticing. And for some right. reason, and it's, you know, I don't want to get on and be like, you have no idea what I'm doing behind the, you know, and it's no, not but sometimes, thing. sometimes an Instagram pick post like sure. means more to people just because they at least know that you're aware. They can see. And, yes. Precisely. And so it, it is a weird dance that we do, but no, yeah. it, it's an important topic. You know, we are contributing and taking it very seriously. And you're right that we are essentially, whether or not we totally meant to be Mm -hmm. journalists and that we're reporting on something, we're reporting on really dark stuff where there are victims. We hold people's like stories and lives in our hands, basically. Yeah. Oh yeah. And there's, there's people out there, you know, families who Mm -hmm. have to deal with us talking about this kind of stuff. So hopefully- we are seen as being take as taking it seriously yeah. if we ever you know crack jokes hopefully no one thinks it's at the expense of an actual person you know yes yes like in, on any day under any circumstances that's really as far you know the farthest thing from what we want to do um and you know as much as like I said I, I don't normally go around saying oh this is what I'm doing to but I just want to I basically just want to assure you anybody who's wondering that like we do we are deeply we care we care a lot um, yes. And it's something I've been, you know, just with my friends and family who were affected by this have been just very heartbroken. And um, it's been a tough couple weeks yeah. in the world if for everybody, but obviously for. Um, and also this is a time maybe to, I know at the same time we're saying, don't worry, we are aware of what's going on and we mm-hmm. do care. And we, you know, it feels like not only does it feel right to say something, but it would feel very wrong to not say something. Yes. But this is also a time to, on the same, at the same time, thank people for wanting to hold us accountable yes. just in case. Cause you didn't, you, you don't know what we're up to. I mean, for all you know, yes. that, you know, 
we're just kind of dancing around with a podcast and not taking and anything ignoring, seriously. So, yeah, completely. so thank you for reaching out and asking what we're doing. Yes. Or I, I know a lot of times, anytime I do post something, a lot of times, anytime, yikes. Uh, <laughs> but whenever I do post something on Instagram, even though that's not exactly the way I would, that's not where like my action ends. Right. But right, I right. do appreciate that people reach out and say, thank you for posting this. It is encouraging to know that yes. I'm, I'm doing the right thing or I'm making people feel seen. So on the same coin, thank you for letting us know, but also you got nothing to worry about. We are on it. Yes. And um, feel free, you know, if there is something we're missing, obviously we are two white people. And if there, obviously we don't have yes. that, these kind of experiences. So if there's something where you're like, Hey, maybe they should know about this, that, or the other, or they should approach this differently. Like, please let us know. Um, I'm here we, to learn we, and educate we love, myself. We love uh, helpful criticism, like yes. on, honest educational criticism. So we want to be the best we can. So yes. And this podcast has definitely taught <laughs> us a lot over the years, um, just in general. Like, I feel like I'm a completely different person the way I approach hands down topics and I really yeah. like think about terminology, think about our place in the world mm -hmm. and our privilege. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Completely. Um, so I just, I'm always really thankful that like we have this platform. It comes with a lot of like pressure and responsibility, but also I'm like really thankful that we're in this position and, um, and that you, that you and I are both like on the same page, you know, I feel like it's, I don't know. I'm just thankful that, uh, I don't know. I just love no. you. That's all. Oh, what a twist. I, just, I'm I so love thankful you too. that like you and I are like totally on a team <clears throat> with this kind of thing. And we're, well, no. I think, you know, I, I mean, this is not to like, I mean, I guess that it feels kind of weird that we're turning it into us, but I, this is another opportunity to say, like, I've listened back to our older episodes and I definitely see a change in yes. us. So hopefully we're also changing perspectives for other people. Yes. Yes. That's a good point too. Um, on many different, uh, platforms as we've, as we, you've maybe learned, some people might've learned alongside us as we learned, right. Um, which is kind of a fun, I mean, I learned, you know, for example, M went to clown college as you learned it with me. And so I hope to think <laughs> there are other bigger issues in the world that we've all learned together. And like, like our privilege and our place right. in the world and like how we can help others and stuff. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. It's a, so. it's a wide gamut of the things we have all <laughs> learned together. Like one end is sassy and the other end is like, major world epidemics but you know yes but anyway <laughs> we uh we hope everybody that has been affected by this we hope that you're doing okay and yes. if there's anything else we can do to help or organizations we don't know about that you would like us to to you know make aware to other people yes definitely let us know yes and in the meantime we're learning and we're educating ourselves and uh doing what we can and we'll put all the links in the show notes if anybody else wants to um, check them out or you know see how you can help well said Christine with your well little said, speech Emily. earlier you did a great job <laughs> thank I you I felt like I was giving like a school presentation because I realized halfway through I wasn't breathing but I was like if I breathe now I'm gonna go <gasps> and it's yeah. gonna be like, so awkward <laughs> no worries so. I it, it, I appreciate it. also this is a complete sharp left turn but just so everybody knows, because this comes out at the end of March. Mm -hmm. And I know last year we requested everybody to remind us around uh -huh. April Fool's Day <laughs> <Yes>. that <laughs> we should do something because our only our, like our first year on the podcast, we took it seriously and it was such a great episode. And then we completely neglected it for the well, next few years. Well, last year we did all those uh, secret creepy messages and people still to oh, this yeah. day are like, <laughs> what are these scary ghosts in the background <laughs> i will say that one was less fun than having other people record our episode for well us. we got to watch bob's burgers and eat pizza so yeah i think that anything fun. that's not that is less fun but let's just say that in a couple of days we did come out with a, an idea for an april Fool's we're prepared episode. this time for once and we already we already recorded it. it is a, a great a great gig so if you would like to hop on and actually Oof. see us celebrate the the beginning of april you know go check it out if you want to see the ultimate fools celebrating april 1st you can watch us <laughs> also april 1st we're gonna do uh, an instagram live oh yes uh, a special instagram live we we've i know a lot of people have been wondering where our instagram lives went because we were doing those at the beginning of the pandemic and so since we're calling April Fools a holiday. We're gonna give you an Instagram live. So go be on Instagram all day and wait for our call. Yes, wait for our siren call. We are very excited about the April first episode. It's like totally uh, different and new and exciting, and we just can't wait for you to hear it. So check yeah. It out.
Christine, between my phone, my laptop, the TV, my VR, I just have the worst headaches lately. And it's because I know I'm straining my eyes. I know I'm messing around with blue light, which is, it's just too much for me. So well, I have luckily, a solution. I was going to say, I have a solution for you. Wait a minute. Let's say it at the count of three. Oh my God. What if it's the same thing? One, two, three. Felix, Felix Gray. Gray. Yeah. Ah! Even when M gets to watch me on the computer screen, there's a downside, which is all this blue light. <laughs> and that's why now at nighttime, I always put on my Felix Grays when I'm trying to get to bed and I'm like, oh my God, I can't stare at a screen any longer, but I have to, I have to work and all that good stuff. I'm sure you all understand. You can get dry, tired eyes, have trouble sleeping because like it can impact your melatonin secretion. That is why we love and highly recommend Felix Grey. They also have the more advanced sleep glasses that relieve serious daily eye strain and were especially designed for late night screen time to improve sleep. That is me right there. Yeah, Blaze actually. loves the, he's obsessed with those. So finally, a pair of glasses designed for the 21st century. Go to felixgrayglassescom slash drink to shop glasses at work as hard as you do. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com slash drink. Free shipping, free exchanges, 30-day money-back guarantee. FelixGreyGlasses.com slash drink. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to check what level I'm on today. So M guessed 15 gajillion, and I'm pretty sure that's actually pretty spot on. Uh, we're talking about Best Fiends and my constant rise to the top on levels. <laughs> and uh, I think I'm just going to go with M's guess of 15 gajillion. With Best Fiends, you can also feel like you were always at the top. Uh, <laughs> you can feel just like Christine. Uh, with Best Fiends, there's something new today and tomorrow and every day after that. There's literally thousands of levels to play and counting, plus tons of cute characters to collect and uh, get really attached to, oh, a la Christine and Lemon. So cute. I love getting attached to my little guys, collecting them. So much fun. I compete with myself because no one else wants to compete with me because I'm a level 15 gajillion. <laughs> but it is always fun. Who, who could compete? Who could compete at 15 gajillion? You Listen, know? I'm offering. Somebody want to step up to the plate? No? Okay, fine. <laughs> so download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Okay, so I have a story I think you'll like, Miss mm, Christine. I better like it. I hope you like it. <laughs> I'm sure I, I will love it. I like it. I think the person involved didn't like it though. Oh. Uh, this is the, this is an alien abduction case. <gasps> I'm um, scared already. And I got to say, this was probably some of the easiest research I've ever done because I can only find one article about it. <laughs> it's um, like, it's like a good and a bad thing. Cause it's like, oh, it's all right here for me, but also like, <laughs> this is it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, usually I, I'm using at least like 15 links or yeah. 15 sites to like really compile it all together. But yeah, this is one, luckily one very long article. Okay. Um, and also super lucky, probably the luckiest I've ever been because in terms of there only being one article, uh, this was written by a reporter taking the actual story from that person. So Ooh. it's, it's pretty much a, a, direct source or like one one removed from a direct source so <gasps> okay i'm excited so the only link that i could the only link that is out there happened to be on mysterious universe so that is where i got this all from you could pretty much go to the website and look up the article yourself and i want to apologize now that because this information only came from one place it's pretty much a direct read of the article. So I just want to give it credit. I tried to, you know, paraphrase it and, and make it more my own, but it's, you're going to be able to see the exact points of the article uh, if you were to look back on it. So anyway, so this is Mysterious Universe. And apparently the person who wrote this was contacted by the abductee herself because she wanted her story told. Mm. So uh, this is basically a whole synopsis of her experiences her name was laura clark by the way so Ooh, okay laura clark if you are listening i hope i do you justice uh if not please don't be mad at me i tried my best and also to correct me if you'd like um so laura clark was born in fayetteville arkansas which by the way is home to the duggars oh um, <laughs> Wow, how special. I was suckered in from sentence one. I was oh, like, yeah. let's go. This You were like, okay, picked my next topic. Don't even know what it is. <laughs> also, Laura Clark, if you know the Duggars, please email us as well. Oh, God. Uh, yes, born in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And she moved around a lot uh, because her dad was in the army, but it was her, her mom, her dad, and her sister, Barbara. And this happened or began in the 60s. So they finally landed on a place in 
uh, Alaska. Um, I think it was Fairbanks, Alaska, or it could have been Anchorage. I kind of got confused in the article, but there's like, I think like a six hour difference between the two places. So I'm not sure which one it is, but uh, it was in Alaska in 1963. And Laura's first experience was uh, when her mom, oh, she was five, by the way, Laura was five. And her mom was tucking her and her sister, Barbara, into their beds. And they uh, shared a room just in case that's important. So Barbara and Laura were being put to bed. And this was Laura's first supernatural experience. I just want to say now a lot of this, are, there are direct quotes from her. So I tried to, instead of giving you like big blocks of quotes, I tried to just kind of paraphrase mm. what she said. But again, if you check the article, you will be able to see pretty much all of this in quote format. <laughs> but so her mom walks away, uh, you know, leaves the room and Laura remembers being the only one awake and hearing someone in the hall. And she thought it was her mom. Mm. Then she re- remembers that the door opened or the uh, a light shone, shined through the room and she saw, quote, several small, thin, light gray people with no. large blank, uh, not blank, with large black slanted eyes staring into my room. No, thanks. I'm not interested. She said, I was surprised and just stared back at them, which like, yeah, what else do you fucking do? Well, and you're five too. So it's almost like you don't know much of the world yet anyway. It's not like you even have a comprehension of, yeah, this is an alien. This is wrong. <laughs> it's like, why are you opening my door when you should be my mom? Your mom. Yeah. Oh, also this was, uh, I don't know if this is, this was written in at all to say anything about like how skeptics would feel about it, but it is interesting to note only two years earlier was the barney and betty hill uh, alien abduction story oh yeah which for those of you who are interested i covered that in episode 49 um that was like the first like famous famous case in the in america i think i remember that and um they were the first people i think to mention grays it gray aliens so some people could say like oh well that only happened two years earlier you're five maybe that like you're putting it in your own imagination or something whatever whatever i'm gonna go off of the fact that laura is of sound mind so so she sees these gray creatures staring at her uh and laura looked at her sister to see if her sister was seeing this but her sister was sleeping calm as a cucumber and then she realized that her sister barbara's blankets were getting pulled off of her by themselves uh don't love that and all of a sudden barbara quote floated into a standing position that's the sister the sister so she went from sleeping in her bed to the the covers getting pulled off by themselves nothing is doing it they're just falling off of her and then she is floated into a standing position can i just tell you something real quick that is like kind of a sidebar but like happened last night that i just remembered when you said that oh christine what I, happened I, I was laying in bed and like falling or i was trying to fall asleep i was not asleep i mean this is how every fucking one of these stories starts but this has never happened to me before so i was like flipped out and i was like i have to tell em tomorrow and i completely forgot until just now <clears throat> what blaze was asleep i was laying in bed geo's at the end of the bed like dead asleep and i was kind of laying there and you know how when you're falling asleep you just kind of like play out things in your head or you're just like mm-hmm. thinking so i like started picturing some scene I don't know I was trying to like go through a conversation I'd had and all of a sudden it like morphed and there was this I don't even know how to describe it it was like this creature and it was sort of like the Cheshire cat like it was like smiling and it was like coming out of a wall and just kind of laughing at me and I remember my first instinct was like "Uh uh, (laughs) uh-oh and I remember thinking like this is not a safe place for my mind to be it was so weird I don't know how to describe what I was thinking but it was sort of like this isn't a dream. It was sort of like, uh oh, like something bad's happening. And I was like, I need to snap myself out of it. And then all of a sudden, my <laughs> my blankets got like fucking pulled off my shoulders and like <gasps> halfway down my body. And so of course I like jerked up and I was like, okay, okay, that was the cat. Like luckily the cat must. And I looked up and the cats are both sleeping in Geo's bed, like over on the other side of the room. And I'm just sitting oh, there Christine. going, what the fuck? And I like looked at my covers and they were like clearly not on my body (laughs) it's like oh my god and it was very strange because I remember thinking I have to snap myself out of this and all of a sudden it felt like somebody just like like you know how they I mean just like this like they say in these stories like someone yanked my blankets 
I've never had that happen. And I was like, oh dear. And I can still picture that creepy smiling face, like turning. Oh my God. I have such me. intense goose game. Right now. <laughs> I forgot about it until oh you said God. the covers got yanked off. And I went, oh my fucking God. Like last night I was telling myself, you have to remember it. And I was not asleep yet. Like I was just kind of moseying through my mind. And all of a sudden this like horrible image appeared and my coverage just got anyway, sorry, that was so irrelevant, but like it scared oh the absolute God jesus out of me so wow that's a lot to unpack um <laughs> it feels like it, to me if it had a creepy face and you had a gut instinct that it was unsafe yeah and it was waiting for you to be kind of like in like more of like a vulnerable yeah like, space it feels dangerous for you th- and then like to feel the it's almost like it was watching you while you were sleeping and then like when it realized you were more coming to it like got rattled or something i hate that holy it was shit. it was almost like it didn't feel like sinister so much as it felt like trickstery like it was like trying to fuck with like me. a poltergeist yeah like it felt like it was trying to fuck with me and i remember going it worked okay please leave me alone and then i took my covers and i like wrapped them very tightly around me and i was like don't pull on anything and um anyway i, I felt oh i hate it i felt something next to me uh a while ago like uh, like I, some at some point yesterday i felt something in the bathroom and i was like do you just like watch me sit on the toilet that's such trash no, it probably like, watches you try to wash your face because we're all trying to learn from the best <laughs> like don't use hand soap what is wrong stop with putting you? dial i'm an esthetician stop putting dial hand soap no ew watching you on the toilet is like come on come on not, I don't not know. classy friend i did i did see a tweet at one point it must have been a tweet or a meme or something but uh it said like if you're ever worried that like your parents or your grandparents that they've passed on do the do they like watch you do stuff in bed because they're like creepy ghosts it's like that's not on you that's on them being fucking valid. weirdos okay. so like valid point deal with that so sometimes when i'm in the bathroom and i think like if a ghost were to get me right now like i'd be in trouble and i'd be like but also they're a weird as shit ghost. Also, like, like i'm allowed the to matter with you <laughs> like you couldn't wait till like this wasn't happening like what's your problem what are yeah, you into wait. that's a really good point it says more about them than you yeah it does yeah so anyway I don't know how we got on that tangent, but, um, well, I was I'm, just saying, cause you said the covers got pulled off and I was like, oh, that happened to me last night. I'm so sorry that that happened. That's really terrifying. I would be I, much more scared than you're coming off. It was so weird. Cause I was like, it must be the cat. But then I was like, I, I don't think, a cat, I don't know how a cat could do that. But then also it certainly was not a cat, but ew, I, it was gross. And it was really gross. That's never happened to me before. I don't know. Every now and then I feel like some, something might be like pulling on my covers or like touching the blanket or something and I just have to convince myself that I was so focused on my phone it like just fell a weird way and hit my arm by myself like I caused it because if I get too into the idea that someone is trying to like touch me while I'm in bed again by the way (laughs) um (laughs) I just have to be like no 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 thank you this is it's probably why I don't go to bed until I'm completely exhausted out yeah. of my wits end so that I don't even have to focus on what's around me. You don't have to like think about your surroundings. Yeah. Anyway. Wow. Anyway, so poor Side Barbara. Bar. Um, <laughs> poor Barbara is now floating in a standing position while apparently unconscious. Uh, and five-year-old Laura is just lying there watching this happen. <gasps> and then the same thing happens to Laura where all of a sudden she is also floating in a standing position. And she feels... I don't know how, really how to explain it, but her and Barbara feel themselves floating or without their control being guided or moved in some way. They're floating into the hall towards the stairs and they, she sees the gray aliens in tow. She, once they get to the foot of the stairs, it's very sweet as a five-year-old, but it's also really sad as a, you know, this is a scary situation, but she saw herself floating at the top of the stairs and she was like, I think they want me to go downstairs, but the only way I know how to go downstairs is move my feet. And so she started doing like these weird, like bicycle pedaling mo- oh. motions in the air. A- a kind of like how I imagine, like if you have like put a puppy over some water and oh, like and they, they, start, oh, they start paddling, oh, cute. but so apparently she remembers moving her legs as if she was trying to help get herself mm. downstairs. And suddenly in her head, she heard a voice <gasps> She says, suddenly the first voice I heard was coming from the next, from the one next to me. His mouth did not move, but I heard his thoughts. He said, you don't have to do that. We'll do it for you. 
about the pedaling her legs to go downstairs. <gasps> Ugh, yucko. So they were going to help her downstairs without her needing to do anything. So she stopped moving her, oh, the rest of the quote is, so I stopped moving my legs uh, and felt that I was being floated downstairs without ever touching the steps. They got downstairs and Laura remembers seeing one of the aliens take her sister into another room. And Laura, at that moment, because I guess they were so far away from her, uh, she saw just how short these aliens were. Um, I guess her mom is about 5'2", and they were they looked shorter than her mom. Oh, so, interesting. Fun fact, grays are probably shorter than 5'2". Laura also remembers asking in her head or thinking, are these people like us? And then one of them in her head said, no, we are non-human living beings. <sighs> and then Laura goes on to say, I don't remember anything more about that experience, except that from that day on, Barbara was never the same. She became oh. an angry, defensive, stubborn brat, to put it bluntly. That's so, sad. Justice for Barb. Uh, let's bring that back. Because Seriously. Poor uh, Barbara needs it. Poor Laura times. needs it too. That's um, sad. So anyway, so Laura's dad, again, he's in the military. And so the family is used to moving around a lot. And eventually they end up next in Iowa, in Davenport, Iowa. And Laura is now seven instead of five. So two years have passed. And they live in a house that is next to a ravine. And they have a swing set in the backyard from what Laura remembers. And she says one night while she was sleeping, just like the last time, it always seems to be one night while you're sleeping. When you're so vulnerable. I mean, <laughs> as a seven-year-old, this is horrifying. Laura was somehow aware while she was sleeping that she was outside and floating above the roof and the swing set. Mm. So my first thought is like, oh, this could be like some really cool astral projection. Yeah, maybe she just my first thought too. Maybe she just didn't know she could astral project yet. So she was outside and she was floating above the roof and the swing set, and she could feel herself uncontrollably being moved toward the sliding glass door of their house. And then she felt someone smack her on the butt really hard. Oh, what? Um, and she said her parents didn't spank her, so it was extra jarring because yeah. even her own parents wouldn't do it. But all of a sudden, instead of being asleep while aware that she was outside, she, I guess, came to and woke up. And she realized that she was now laying on top of her covers in her bed. So she wasn't tucked in anymore. <gasps> she was on top of her blankets. And her nightgown was up. <gasps> oh, um. Uh, she said that her underwear was still on, so she doesn't know exactly what happened, but she still felt super violated. So well, yeah, obviously. And even creepier, if it gets worse, she then heard someone in the hallway faking the sound of her mom walking. Ew. What does that yeah. mean? How do you fake the sound? Quote, I knew my mom's normal footsteps in her leather loafers, but this was not her. When I heard, what I heard was as if someone was holding her tiny shoes in their hands and slapping oh them on the, slapping them on the floor in a fake walking sound. Oh my fucking God. That's heinous. I.e. Monty Python with coconuts. Uh, <laughs> same difference. <laughs> same. Di that's how I have to like tell myself so I don't totally panic as panic? I'm trying to go yeah. to sleep. Oh. So Laura and she knew that it was someone trying to fake her mom because she heard the sound of these footsteps slapping through the floor, going into her parents' room, into the closet, hearing the closet door open, hearing the shoes get thrown in there and dropping to the floor, and then hearing the door close. Holy crap. And you have to wonder, like, since the mom was presumably sleeping, like, they could probably keep her asleep so she wouldn't You find up. that out throughout this story. I mean, oh, just great. like Barb, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Barb was sleeping. The parents were sleeping. I mean, it seems like they're able to put everyone in a trance just to Ugh. keep the one person they want awake, which is don't awful. Like, don't love that. And then, as if it couldn't get worse, Laura then, out in the hallway again, heard two, quote, robotic voices talking to each other. Ugh. And she also reminds us in this interview that this was 1965. There were no, like, computers in your home yet where you're used to, like, worrying mechanical sounds. Um, right, or, like, a Siri-type voice, or, like, you've got mail. Like, none of that existed. No Microsoft Sam. She, <laughs> she uh, was very, very disturbed. She was like, this, yeah. is, this was a sound I'd never heard in my entire life. And she said it sounded like two 
computers in hindsight were talking to each other, like lots of beep boop, beep boop pop, you know, or it could have been our podcast, apparently. <laughs> <Beep boop pop. laughs> um, but so she was just so freaked out hearing them talk in the hallway. Nothing else happened after that, but she didn't know any better. So she stayed up all night until morning, all while Barbara slept soundly, by the way, nothing happened to Barbara that time. <sighs> and after this, uh, Laura's mom started noticing that Laura was acting really skittish. Obviously she well, would. Sure. And Laura said nothing about it because she felt this overwhelming anxiety that if she said something, something would happen to her family. Wow. So they probably implanted some fear of, I don't know, maybe don't know. That's, that's where my mind went. Like my, either... oh, that's where my mind went too. of like, they are communicating with her telepathically or something, or maybe it's just like an innate fear as a child after sure. a scary experience. I don't know. Which I mean, I guess you do hear about like, if something in a more true crime sense happens and you get scared to tell your parents because yeah, you're not aware if you're in trouble or not. I mean, I can see that as well. That kind of makes well, let's sense. Let's put it this way. I'm 28. And if there was an alien that abducted me, I would be scared to tell anyone now because Valid. I'd be afraid that they would come after other people I care about. So I think as a seven-year-old, she was totally in her right to feel that way. So two more years pass and now she's nine and they live in Wisconsin. It's even creepier to me that it's multiple locations. Yeah. Like they're really tracking her. You can't hide from them. Two more years have passed and now the family's in Wisconsin. It is 1967. And Laura is nine. One night while she was sleeping, <laughs> per usual, uh, she was woken up by a very bright light. And she heard a, quote, almost electronic little girl's voice. Oh, God. I It really does get worse every time you open your damn mouth, Em. It's almost like it really, every time they push the limit, yes. like every, every time they show up, they're like, okay, well, that was fine. Like, what's next? How about this? an almost electronic little girl's voice. And the voice said, isn't the light pretty? Do you want to come and play in the light? For God's sake. Good night and goodbye. You know what Laura said? In her mind, at least, she thought, I have school tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, thanks, but no thanks. Tell me you get straight A's without telling me you get straight A's. I know, I have a quiz in the morning. <laughs> So Laura oh, got Laura. up Laura got up anyway to at least look out the window and see what this light was coming from and she realized the light was coming directly above their garage and that it was a very wide beam of light and we know what happens with light beams in UFO stories. Uh-huh. Her body all of a sudden started to feel like every cell was quote vibrating apart from them. Like, Ooh. like her body was completely separating from a molecular, <sighs> molecular level. Ugh. And then she was somehow, all of her cells were transferred or moved from inside the room to outside of her house, like through the wall, through the, the Weird. wood studs. And all of a sudden she was outside and her cells were all put back together. Oh, how weird is that? So it's almost like that's how they phase through solid objects. Yeah. They completely separate themselves and then rebuild on the outside. Fascinating. Um, she, so now she remembers that she's floating in her driveway and essentially was beamed up. She remembers uh, passing through some sort of hatch and going down a hall. And this is a quote from her describing uh, what she had seen. The entire place was made from some kind of silver metal. The hallway had a flat floor, but the wall to my right curved like an arch so that if you went too far to the right, you would hit your head. The hall curved around towards the left, too, as if you were walking in a large circle. As I was floating alone down this long hall, I passed by several doorways. No doors were visible, but I could see each room was pie-shaped like a slice of pie. Oh, that's fun. They should do that with Cheesecake Factory. Like make every, ah, every room a little cheesecake slice. I love that. Narrow on the opposite side from the doorway, but flat like a bite was taken off of the end. So that is what apparently the inside of this craft looked like. It was intriguing. Pie slices. Eventually, Laura actually saw a bigger room down the hall, and it looked like it was probably the control room. It had a lot of like gadgets and screens and shit. But before she even got to the end of the hall, she was moved again against her will into a room with a metal exam table. And she was laid on it. See, I would like to go home now. Thanks. 
That's what she said too. Also yeah. at the same time, Laura also noticed that other people were coming into the room and people they were or grays, gray, the grays. <sighs> she realized they were the same grays that she had met for, during her first experience when she was five. Oh, Teddy. Hi. Good to see you again. How did she yeah. know it was them? Oh God. I think she had some innate knowing. I guess, right. If they talk to her in her head, there's probably some way to know who they are. But also like what a scary confirmation that, oh yeah, they have been keeping complete tabs. This are, this isn't like three isolated events. Mm. It's, they have been following me. This isn't the like same a fancy ones. to meet you here. This is like a. Yeah, this oh, isn't no, a, meet, we've... a meet cute. This no. is a, this is a big, big problem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the famous opposite of a meet cute, a big, big problem. <laughs> She uh, also ended up seeing a different creature other than the grays there, which was a six foot black, completely black praying mantis looking creature. Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. And apparently when she saw him before she even saw him with her eyes, she felt a presence in the room that was quote, completely evil. So I don't know what to do with that information. Like I really don't. So apparently he is just like, she sensed that he was the leader and she sensed complete evil before she even saw him and then realized that this thing was in the room with her. And apparently they like both repelled each other. Like, I don't think he wanted anything to do with her. She (gasps) clearly wanted nothing to do with him. What the heck? And in the middle of her panicking that she felt like she was in danger, all of a sudden, all the walls were almost made of like smart panels and they turned this really soft blue. And Laura said that it reminded her of like very calming fish tanks. Like, okay. (laughs) You know how when you're inside a very calming fish tank? It's like, this is not not a spa, Laura. I know you know that. (laughs) So this is very mansplaining of me, but like, I don't know if I'd be thinking of fish tanks in this moment. Uh, I mean, I guess what would you be? I mean, as a seven or nine year old, you'd be like, how do I have any other connection to this? True. I wonder Uh, though, I wonder if that's, if they were looking in her mind and thinking like, oh, what would be calming for her? And then they put humans like fish tanks, (laughs) I guess. I don't know. (laughs) Well, if they, if they thought like, oh, you know, maybe this is something that's calming to her and she doesn't even know it. And then they made the walls blue Mm -hmm. and then they heard her thoughts going, this reminds me of calming fish tanks. They were probably like, okay, well, we nailed that. Like we wanted her to feel calm and we got confirmation. And then they wrote down fish tanks, fish tanks. So for the next abduction, everybody was like, why, why am I surrounded by like sharks? And if, if you've been abducted and you have seen fish tank looking lights on a craft that was probably laura's doing that was Laura a, did that a, for you so that was a welcome. note from corporate so <laughs> um so then she also saw that uh there was a gray that seems to be a little girl she okay. was much shorter than the rest she was about three and a half feet tall she had long wispy black hair and slanted completely black eyes yeah so, so I've gone from thinking about astral projection to like black eyed children. Valid point. It's really like a mod podge of, uh-huh. and that's why we drink stories so far. Laura says that she actually was not scared at all of this little gray girl. Um, and she felt like this being was telling Laura that she was her sister. <gasps> um and what's even weirder is this quote from Laura that says, uh, somehow I felt this being was in fact genetically my sister. I wonder if my parents had also been taken by Grays in the past. <gasps> and I was like, yeah. I was like, girl, you can't just say that and walk away, which the, is exactly what she did. We don't uh, know any more than that. <laughs> the connotations behind that are are disturbing. Um, the the, the storyline that you may be meeting your sister because your mother or your father have also been abducted and then assaulted, I'm assuming, for there to be another being out there that is genetically your sister. Um, <gasps> but so it, it made her instantly think, I wonder if like mom and dad have if is this a is this something I inherited from them? This weird gift of being traced. It's, it's certainly a gift, I would say. Yeah, this seems to be really a blessing from the devil. Yeah, <laughs> from uh, the fucking satanic praying mantis or whatever it is. And so the the next quote about this experience was 
Later, I was brought back into my bedroom again by moving right through the window itself. I was floated into my bed, stomach down, and my body was then pulled by this invisible force into a certain position. I was then told that I would have trouble sleeping from now on, and I should put myself in this position from then on to help me fall asleep. I've had to do this ever since, and I have been plagued by severe insomnia for the rest of my life. Okay. Also, girl, what's the position? Like you got- I thought what? it was on your stomach, she said. They said they put her on a- I was floated onto my bed, stomach down. My body was then pulled by an invisible force into a certain position. Oh, okay. You're right. I don't know. Give it up, man. Some of us are also suffering from insomnia. We've all got insomnia. Do the aliens have like a trick? Like we got to know it. But also it kind of blows my mind because I'm thinking now they're saying, oh, sorry, you're going to have insomnia forever. Why don't they just not give her insomnia? Like what, what, what is the purpose of that? Like, how can they? Maybe they realized, that I I wonder if there's like a, you know how in Wicked, when like you saw the complete opposite side of like what the Wicked Witch was going through, yeah. I wonder if the aliens realized like, oh, she shouldn't have seen the praying mantis. Like that's going to fuck her up. <laughs> oh, like sh- we, we, we told we tr- her to wait in the control room and that motherfucker just needs to insert himself. We, we traumatized her. She's definitely going to have a hard time sleeping now. So maybe they didn't even know they were going to do that. I don't know. I mean, listen, my recommendation is some Z-Quil, yeah. some melatonin. And whatever that cocktail. position is, Laura Clark, you got to let us know. secret alien position. <laughs> um, uh, I'm disturbed. <laughs> and the, the insomnia thing freaks me out that they like told her, sorry, you're going to have this issue forever. Bye. Yeah. It's just so strange that they wouldn't just, well, that A, they would even tell her because it seems like they don't really have her best interests at heart. So why are they even caring? And B, if they care so much, why don't they just fix it i don't know and see and if they're able to put everyone else in a deep sleep so they don't have to yes! deal with the bullshit laura's going through Good why point. can't they just give laura some of that and like oh let you know her what i wonder sleep? what if she's part alien maybe they know something about like her composition uh, her makeup that isn't like other humans and she can't i don't know i don't know that probably maybe too far. i don't know i mean she if she's genetically related to a, a gray then maybe they have more fascination in studying her than someone else but then wouldn't they also be interested in barb who would also have a half sister in space good point you know yeah i wonder i mean yeah Uh, if they both have the same biological parents then yeah that that wouldn't make sense you know so that's so raven had there there's a spinoff now i knew we were going there next totally prepared (laughs) for this twist for those for those of you who don't know, in the world of reboots, uh, That's So Raven has a spinoff called Raven's Home or Raven's House or something. And uh, she has twins and only one of them got her psychic abilities. Uh-huh. So I'm wondering if maybe that's something. Like maybe, that's a good point. Maybe Barbara isn't as special to them. Maybe they think Laura's like more powerful or more co- connected. Yeah, maybe she just has a more of a connection or like genetically is more predisposed to their... I don't know. Mind. She has more space dust in her blood, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, definitely. That's that. the one. That's I'm a scientist. It. Yep. So after this, uh, first of all, Laura did say she had severe insomnia for the rest of her life, but she also had some very minor health issues for the rest of her life, including like every now and then her left foot would just like go numb and <gasps> would, whenever she was walking, it would just kind of drag behind her. Like it wasn't <gasps> listening to her. And also her eyes would start shaking for no reason. It would stop, but every now and then she would have little bouts of her eyes shaking. Weird. And I guess that it that's different than like a seizure. Like, I don't think, I think it's her just acting normally, but her eyes are kind of all over the place. I wonder um, what the foot is. Maybe they tested on it or something. Yeah. I don't know why they would pick. or something. I don't maybe it was like when her cells were like rebuilding oh, themselves right. <laughs> to get through the wall maybe all of a sudden like one nerve is like out of whack they and... like mixed up her toes by accident her toe <laughs> atoms or something um but yeah so she i don't know what the foot thing is but it's interesting that like a part of her still can't control its own movements every now and then very interesting you know mm-hmm. so she's also not surprised has developed uh intense anxiety oh uh, well no shit especially about the praying mantis leader which like i mean i'm developing anxiety and i didn't even see it in real life so i don't blame you i feel like if you're in a room with what you know to be true as completely evil like yeah. a, just a completely malevolent presence like how do you not it's gotta haunt you 
how do you come back from that? Knowing Especially that as it a child exists? who's probably yeah. never necessarily experienced something like that, that level of fear. Or worked through it mentally. And like, sure. now it's just like really a repressed evil that you you know yeah, exists. if you weren't comfortable telling your parents and you just had to know that any day now you could see that thing again. I mean, yeah. of course that would traumatize you. <sighs> so anyway, uh, Laura finally went to her parents after this and uh, she told them what was going on, but they just said that she was having intense oh. nightmares. Okay, well, not good, I guess. Yeah, I mean, so. like, what do you do? Like, a, a part of me is like, oh my God, I can't believe them. But then also I'm like, you know, if a child is like, I'm seeing aliens all the time. I, I don't know what you would do. Like, what would you do? Even if you did believe I, them. Yeah, I think that's almost, if I were to ever deny my child that experience, it would be out of my own fear of not yeah. knowing what, like, who do I bring this to? You yeah, know? or like uh, n- not knowing how to like fix it. Or, I mean, it's totally out of anyone's Ugh. hands, I would think. I'm going to be the worst parent because of how supportive I'm going to be because the <laughs> oh, second <boo-hoo. laughs> the second some my kid comes up to me and says like there's a shadow figure in my closet i'm gonna be like we're burning the closet and like if there's an alien abduction i'm i don't know what i'm gonna i'll believe them but i'll be like that sucks let's just hope it doesn't happen again because i can't help you you know like yeah. i don't know what to do and also i just think about like uh, like what would a kid even how would that even manifest psychologically if you go to your parent who's supposed to be able to help you through anything yeah. and just watch them go like i don't fucking know, I know uh, but i don't i also wonder like maybe the most beneficial thing to do is like believe them but also like comfort them like not be like i'm terrified i'm gonna burn the house down but like oh i wouldn't tell hearing- them i was terrified and i would burn the, the closet down i would just accidentally burn the closet down oops after they told me and i'd be like oh no well at least now there's not trying there. to make s'mores in the back of the closet i guess <laughs> i would I'd be like oh no i have a new job i have to go we have to leave this entire house i would never let them know i was terrified yeah but- i feel like that's the big thing is like a like the believing is a big part of it i think because you know you hear about all those kids who in true crime or in paranormal stuff whose parents don't believe them and how damaging that is but then also like yeah you don't want your parents to be equally as out of control and terrified because they're supposed to be protecting you and even if you are you probably have to pretend to be the strong one yeah whoever yeah. the the new warrens are or the alien version the alien abduction warrens i would have to have their number on speed dial so yeah thank god we have like the internet and all of our listeners who could probably uh be like here's what to do because <laughs> yeah, i wouldn't know yeah. what to do uh anyway so she told that she told her parents they said that she was having nightmares and that being said, Laura always thought that her mom actually knew more than she was letting on. Oh, so I was going to say too, like if, if she really had that weird instinctual feeling that her parents had been abducted before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. So ma- that she would that, that, sorry, but that brings up a whole other like slew of factors of like, okay, it's one thing if you don't know what to do, it's one thing if you don't believe your kid, but it's another thing to know what they're going through and just not fucking say anything. Like yeah. not to totally judge Laura's mom. I don't know what I would do in that situation, but that's a whole other ball of wax I yeah. hadn't even thought of. So uh, you anyways. probably are traumatized too, as if you went through that yeah. as a parent, you know what I mean? Anyway, so Laura always thought her mom might've known something more, but mm. anyway, five years later go by and it's 1972 and Laura is 14 and uh, her parents are now divorced and she's living with her dad in a suburb of Chicago. So Laura was about to go to bed and she noticed that the light in her room was off when she uh, went in, but she had left it on. So why was the light turned off all of a sudden? Turn right around. Yeah. <laughs> go back to the kitchen, eat a pop tart. Yeah, don't go in there. exactly. Have two, have three. Have the whole uh, box. I don't care. And this is a quote from her. As I stepped into my room and closed the door, I suddenly became very weak and tired. It Mm. hit me like a ton of bricks and I stumbled over to my bed and fell into it. What was going on? You know, what's interesting is it's like whenever they've decided to visit her before, she was already sleeping in her room and there was a deep sleep. It's almost like they're not trancing, putting her in a trance, but putting that perimeter, that space (gasps) in a trance because the second she walked in- the second she walked in she was exhausted but beforehand she wasn't wow that is weird you know yeah so i don't know if she's actually being 
put in some sort of spell or if it's just the space she's in but then there was that time where her sister was asleep but she was awake oh that's a good point too which is also weird maybe this is like a new gray like an intern and he like doesn't totally know he fucked up he doesn't know how things get started usually oh like the boss ran out and was like i don't know you get this you get this thing kicked off and he's she's like i don't know um okay so while on her bed so in the middle of her like passing out because she's so exhausted while on her bed she saw that her closet door was closed but the light inside was on yeah that's somehow really awful i don't even know why but that's just awful something's and the then the closet door opened Mm -hmm. and a gray came out Mm-mm. And Laura passed out. And the next thing she remembers is her floating over her house, moving towards her front door. Almost as okay. if they were returning her. Oh, she was coming back. Ugh. Okay. Yikes. She says, I noticed my clothes were all stuck to me like I was vacuum sealed. And I felt very <gasps> cold and clammy. When I was when I was brought to the bedroom, they set me down on the floor and I could feel the invisible force leave me and my clothes fell away from my body again like the vacuum suction had left. Ooh, that gave me goose cam. What a freaky idea. It's so wild because I feel like we all know these tropes of what an alien abduction entails. And whenever I hear a Uh detail I've never thought of, it's for some reason more credible to me because it could be like a total random thing that someone made up. But it's just, there's an eeriness to it that it, someone has thought. No, you're that. totally right. Cause it's you not know? just another like cliche. It's almost yeah. like something you would never have thought of. That is also just so creepy. That adds to the story vacuum sealed. How weird. Yeah. And then all of a sudden when she felt them like leave her clothes fell oh. off of her. Um, she also heard the sound of like a humming or a drone um, and trees moving as if there was a huge gust of wind or a chopper nearby. So or a I'm imagining cleaner, <laughs> or I think it was probably like the, she heard the hum of like the UFO's engine as it was flying away or something. Yeah. 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 And then she saw this quote light beam leave. Mm. So, and she basically, she saw, um, like the helicopter sounds went away. The trees stopped rustling as if there was a big wind that went by and she just like went to sleep. She just passed out. She was so exhausted from That's whatever traumatic. happened. So that was the next experience. And then we get to 1981 when she's 23. Oh boy. Laura is now living in rural New York with her husband. Okay, Laura. Uh, she's she's got doing a- shit. They're like, no, keep coming with us. And she's like, I got my own life to live, man. Well, you know, what's interesting too, is that she, in the beginning of her life, they were coming every couple of years and it slowly started getting further and further apart so i don't know if that was kind of like you know how if something's like wrong at medically with you and you go to the doctor more often and then this things get better like you you don't have to go as often like there's a bigger gap between visits fully exactly what you're talking about yes (laughs) good because i don't and i was just totally (laughs) telling you your own life yeah well there are times where you're like always going to doctor yeah i see what you're saying and then like over time you hopefully those don't diminish. have to go as yeah. often yeah so i'm a, i'm wondering if because she was like new on the ufo docket of people to visit they were checking on her more often and then as time went on they only needed to check in on her well you know what i wonder too which this could be just total bullshit is like at that time she was a kid and growing really rapidly and i wonder <gasps> if like it was more of like well, tracking her growth and development if she was related to these aliens somehow versus like Christine uh, versus yes, for, I'm convinced now oh my gosh versus so like right. when you get older and you, you know you don't develop or change all that much once you're past teenage years wow that is <laughs> horrific wow it's so like when you go to the pediatrician to get like when you're a little baby or whatever and then it like stop but I like we keep relating this to the doctor as if like a giant evil praying mantis overlord <laughs> is the same as a pediatrician but um I wouldn't that be terrible though if it's every two years and then by the time you hit like 16 you're like oh god any day now and then it doesn't happen and then it doesn't happen and then 23 and you're like fuck yeah no there's like a mental torture to it which she she did mention not in so many words but she was like at this point like what seven four why can't i do fucking math i don't know nine nine years at this point nine years had passed and so she was like i had never gone that long in my life not hearing from them so i just thought things were getting better yeah you would hope it was the end 
Yeah. She was like, I've, I've never gone this long without an alien abduction. Yeah. Can you same girl. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so she was in rural New York. She's 23. She has a husband, Lance, and they have a two-year-old son named Morgan. Aww. And uh, one night her and Lance were watching TV. Laura noticed that Lance got up very quickly from the couch without a word and just started like walking really quickly uh, to the bedroom Uh-oh. and said that he started quote walking in a stiff disjointed way like oh almost like his own body like wasn't in his control anymore oh no can you imagine like they really in terms of originality they've gone above and beyond every time they go see her and now this is the first time that she's seeing like someone else be affected by them while she's awake while he's awake you know they're they're getting more comfortable with her being coherent and seeing everything happen Horrible. in front of her. Horrible. And so she's just like, she thinks nine years, they're not coming after me anymore. And now her husband gets up and starts walking really weirdly and, you know, is acting out of sorts. And all of a sudden he stumbles into bed. He was, they were just watching TV like normal. And all of a sudden he stumbles into bed and just passes out and goes into the super deep sleep, almost like he's in a trance. Oh God. Oh God. She freaks out and goes to check on her son, Morgan, yeah, right. and, finds, and finds out that he's also all of a sudden in an unshakable sleep. And she says that it's almost as if he was, quote, frozen in time. Well, you don't want that with a two-year-old either. Like, that's terrifying. But all of a sudden, the only two people in your house cannot be woken. <gasps> I mean, nightmare, real nightmare. And so I'm sure she, even if she's doing better after nine years, I, I can't imagine you just stop always wondering what's going to happen next with these grays and so i think she freaked out and was like fuck like i'm pretty sure something's about to happen not again and she went to go yeah she went to go check on her son on her son <clears throat> and then she heard the trees blowing really mm-hmm. intensely she saw a bright light over their house and she heard a humming sound outside and then she heard the humming sound inside <clears throat> and this is a quote from her <clears throat> I checked the front door and it was locked. So I turned around and was stopped in my tracks when I saw a very short being standing in my kitchen. Oh my God. I stared at it trying to figure out what it was. I had apparently walked right past it. This was something new I'd never seen before. It was shorter than my son and I thought it was odd. I had It had a very round basketball sized head with tiny black eyes and I could see no other features except that it was wearing a long sleeved white robe that covered everything else. I could see no hands or feet and I thought, oh my God, he's shorter than my son. And the thing replied telepathically, huh, yes, but we are very, very old. <laughs> what (laughs) what the hell oh wait so he was shorter than a two-year-old he was shorter than a two-year-old wearing a robe wearing like a paper towel like what do you mean a robe it it feels very yoda like just like a tiny 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 old man old very old very very old it's so strange i mean it's like the opposite of when you talk about three kids in a trench coat it's like (laughs) the opposite of that like the honey i shrunk the kids version but like they uh but yeah so she saw one just standing in the kitchen after i feel like i would like step on it like i feel like i wouldn't even see it you know what i mean I if it's like a foot off the ground it's like a walking newborn you know gross which is actually now that you say it way creepy yeah then she heard so she sees this thing i would imagine at least slightly petrified of the experience then she heard the front door open and five more grays floated in goodbye are and- they also really tiny or do we know I don't know what they look like in comparison to the very, very old one, but the five grays that did float in apparently all looked identical, but they apparently had very different personalities. So I'm thinking like the seven dwarfs, like <laughs> bashful, hungry. Oh, my oh God. there's not, a, there's, that's not, there's not, I hungry. always that's... call it hungry too. And everyone's like, that's not one. And I'm like, I guess I'm projecting. So I think <laughs> we're both on the same page there. Bashful, grumpy. I would be grumpy also. Sleepy. That one's me. Uh, I think but yeah. like we're all of them encompassed <laughs> plus hungry. We're all of them except like sneezy. I don't know. Well, okay. So uh, speak for yourself. I have sinusitis. 
so anyway, the all of them looked identical but had different personalities. They floated in, and this is super weird, but Laura said that I guess she never noticed before, but if they were all floating or it, they also have to float to move everywhere, I guess she probably thought this whole time like, oh, I they have to make me float so that they can move me so that I'm lightweight and so I don't have to move myself. But I think maybe this was the first time she realized that the way that they get around everywhere is they float. Interesting. It and she keeps feeling like she's one of them. Like she can yeah. move that way too, you know? She well, they, she also said this is like the weird part is that for them, apparently it looked really weird to see them floating because the way that they would like propel themselves anywhere since they're not touching the ground is they would it kind of looked like an upright doggy paddle that they she Stop said they it. were they were quote pushing through jello is what it looked like like just what well you know weird... I wonder if that's because they're not used to this atmosphere like maybe in maybe. their atmosphere it's a different gravity pull or something. Yeah, I don't know. That's actually a really good point. Thank you. I'm You're talking directly out of my ass, but I'm glad that it was a good point. <laughs> she thought that one of them was uh, actually walking down the hall at one point, but then it like snuck up around her and got right in her face. Goodbye. Um, and she said that he apparently smelled really bad. <clears throat> she says, quote, I noticed a strong, nasty smell. It was a combination of urine and sweet spices and vomit. And it made me want to throw up. Oh, it makes me want to throw up. Right yeah, now. that was that was a really awful description. It's very, very uh, specific and, and detailed. Thank you, Laura. It's one I can follow easily and I hate it. Um, <laughs> so this really bad smelling one that was all up in her grill, this gray tried to actually fuck with her head and I guess telepathically make her feel like garbage and make her scared of them what? and to make her feel worthless. And I think it was like cower and fear from them or something like that. Oh, and she, she insulted that really short one. It's probably like you're short as shit and you smell like vomit. They're um, overcompensating. <laughs> yeah. uh, also, you look like you're swimming through jello. Get it together. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, I guess they have, a, they have a lot of reasons to not feel welcome in the home. <laughs> and so she, he was trying to intimidate her. And Laura says that she did want to cry, but she wasn't going to give in. So she looked him dead in the eyes. Yes, Laura. Also, that must be a scary looking someone dead in the eyes. Like those especially black slanty eyes. Uh -uh. Especially like the eyes of someone that is not a human being and who wants <sighs> you to be terrified of them. I can't imagine. But she owned it. She stared him dead in the eyes. And Get apparently uh, she, this is when she noticed for the first time that their quote, all black eyes were actually uh, normal eyes and the irises were black and the pupils were darker than black. Ooh. Yikes. Ooh. And she, she also said that their skin up close looks like rough cowhide. Ooh. Yeah. So that is when this gray being all of a sudden quote flooded my mind with memories of every time that they had visited her in the past and they told laura that her memories were connected to them she was terrified and so yeah. she started in her mind praying for help and she was thinking please god help me jesus and the gray uh -oh. said telepathically yes we know god too I hate it. <sighs> I hate it. Ah, what? Which made her feel like, okay, so no one's coming to help no me. No one's helping me. Okay, this is so wildly terrifying. I don't know that that got me good. My goose cam is out of yeah. this world right now. I'm like shivering, honestly. <sighs> so now she realizes that she's floating and they take her outside and she sees the beam of light again. And then nothing. And she woke up later. So it's almost like, like it's almost like she like called their bluff on being intimidated. And they're like, okay, you just don't get to remember this one then. Goodbye. Wow. Yeah. They're like, we're done. Snap. Well, I also, I mean, that must be extra terrifying too. Now that you have a kid, there's like that protection fear right. of like, I hope they don't touch him. Like get out of my fucking house. Like don't touch my family. Yeah. Oh, terrible. <clears throat> terrible. We know uh, God too. Oh. Uh, that, that one got so me bad and true to form i did these notes like 10 hours ago which means it was like 3 a.m or something Ugh. so i was 
in my own house. And there was this wild windstorm last night, Christine, like, to, like I was nervous. I thought that like a, like a chair on our balcony was going to like break through the door or something. It was really bad. Ugh, and chills. so all I heard, I was in like pitch silence and I just kept hearing this nasty wind and things getting ruffled around my house. And at 3 a.m. I just read, you know, God too. And I was Ugh. like, I was when like, you're reading about out. like the, the trees were blowing with the UFO it was descent. Prime, it was prime uh, ambient sounds for what I was reading. So now she's floating. She sees the beam of light and she just wakes up and doesn't remember anything. So this is a quote from her about the next day. When I woke up, I found a red spot with a scab just below my belly button, mm. which this is the first time we're seeing anything invasive potentially yep. happening to her. When I pulled at it, the scab, it popped off and seemed to be attached to a long, thin sheath of tissue that, no. had, been, that had been burrowed down in my belly. No, I hate this. I don't like it. It must have been about five inches long. Oh, my God. It seemed that something had been perhaps implanted within me. Oh, my God. I'm going to puke. It was as if something like a giant fat needle had been shoved okay. deep into my belly and okay. it left a long hole. Okay. 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 It didn't even bleed or anything. I wrapped the sheath in a tissue and saved it as proof. Then I went to wipe myself after peeing and I could not believe what I saw on the toilet. There was a large circle of thick oily substance, but it was divided in half, like half circle of bright yellow and half circle of bright amber orange, thick oily liquid. It was as if the two could not mix and they were touching, but not mixing together. Wait, so this came from her weird tissue? So no. So these are two separate events. So she found this red spot on her in next to her belly button pulled on it and okay, found yeah. this like telling me again yeah the I thin sheath it. yeah uh-huh. okay so that tissue that she found or or uh that sheath that she found she put in a tissue Got then it. she went to go pee and when she wiped oh when she her, wiped oh when oh, she oh. wiped i think if i'm reading it right her pee and something else that <gasps> was very oily were separating on the toilet paper in front of her <gasps> oh no oh no so she was panicked and she didn't know what to do she planned on saving the toilet paper as more proof but then she was like who do i give this toilet paper of my right. pee to and so she didn't know what to do she just threw it away like what uh, truly it's like what would you possibly do what could you but do also like what happened to your belly and also was that one of two operations or implantations where now the second one is this weird pee thing well or was the first one an implantation and part of the effects of whatever's inside you now was that you are peeing out some residue well i mean i have a theory and it's not what? a good one i mean what? right here below your belly button is like where your womb would be or where like you would do like an amniocentesis like needle uh oh. like that's how they get to your like womb slash placenta Oh and my I, God. my thought is like, if there's discharge of some kind, like, I don't know what it is, but if it's like a foreign type of discharge, it could very well be related to however they're accessing your oh uterus. Oh my God. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Oh, Laura I want to jump out a window. Wow. That is Beyond. And again, this is just me speculating, but that was where my mind, but I horrifyingly, it's, it's a speculation I hadn't even thought of. So like when I, it's just reminding me of when she was talking about how her, she thought like her parents had been taken and had procreated somehow, you know? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Christine. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Okay. I'm okay. Okay. Well, what year was that? That was 81. Okay. I'm trying to do math here. Whatever. Okay. Next. Three years <laughs> later. Three years later. 1984. It's still not fucking over. Oh, no. 1984. She's around. I'm guessing around 1984. She was around 26 years old. And Laura is now divorced and remarried and also has a daughter named Rachel. I do not know how old Rachel is, but if she is around three, now I'm fucking <laughs> panicked. Now I'm fucking panicked that Rachel is part alien. Well, it was weird because she always like wore a little robe and wandered around and called herself very old. (laughs) Nobody knew why she behaved that way. 
<sighs> Rachel, if you listen to this podcast for some reason, because you would have been born in the early 80s. You would have so... been born, presumably, unless there's a different gestation period, nine months after said uh, oh my God. abduction. <laughs> I'm not saying you're an alien. I'm just saying, can you confirm for me are you're not you an okay alien? Okay, is what I want to know. Are you okay? Are, are you is, all right? I just want to know because I'm now I'm kind of freaked out that I like maybe get a blood test. I'm just checking. I'm just I would be nervous. Or maybe okay. don't because like the government might intervene and I don't want to know what would happen. <laughs> Actually, never ever find out. <laughs> um, okay. Yikes. So, I'm so I sorry. Hope Rachel does not listen to this. We are not Rachel, helping. <laughs> I hope you take this in jest. It's just very, it's odd timing. So I'm, I'm curious. That's all. Okay. So now has a daughter, Rachel, and Morgan is now five years old. Morgan is five. Guess how old Laura was when things started happening. Oh, shit. Five. Oh, you're right. Oh, no. And if we're wondering if things are generational or inherited, and Laura always oh, thought, no. oh, my mom maybe saw something and she just never told me. And now I see things and now my kid is five. What could go wrong? What could happen? One night. Oh, fuck. Laura is watching TV and in her head, she hears a voice. Wake up. Go to your son. He needs you. (gasps) Probably a parent's worst nightmare. I wouldn't know, but that sounds horrifying to me. Although I will say if I were to ever, I, I hope I never have that experience, but if I were to have that experience, I would assume that if I'm hearing that voice, it's almost like someone saying like, this is your, your last, like you still have a chance that everything's going to be okay because I'm warning you before it's too fucking late. Yeah. So I guess it's almost in the worst, most terrifying way. It's comforting that someone was looking out, I but guess. anyway, she goes to check on Morgan. Morgan is laying in bed and he looks like he's been pulled up from his bed and that his head and his shoulders are above his pillow. So it's almost like he's pulled almost out of his covers. Okay. And his blankets are weirdly neatly folded over the rest of his body. And his bedding is not, but he and his clothes are covered in blood. What the weirder part to me is that his bedding is untouched with blood, almost as if he was bloodied and then placed in there or they tried, they tried to put him in there, but they couldn't. And so that's why he's like weirdly positioned over his pillow. What the hell? So it, to me, it sounds like it was a severe nosebleed. Um, blood was like coming out of his nose. Uh, so I'm assuming it's a nosebleed, but the, Again, blood wasn't anywhere on the bedding. So Laura runs to the neighbor and tells them to call 911, but her neighbor is also acting really weird. <gasps> oh, here's a quote. She followed me upstairs and acted very strange. As I ran to the bathroom to get cold, wet washcloths and towels, she brought a dining chair in from the kitchen and parked <gasps> herself at the head of his bed and didn't do or say a thing. It was almost like she was in a trance. She eventually left after I asked her again to call for help and she never did. Oh my God, no. It's like a horror movie. So I don't know if if this is uh, like an, an alien abduction thing. I don't know if someone was almost possessing the neighbor to keep tabs on the kid. Like why would they interact with the the neighbor at all? to make well, sure one thing i was wondering earlier too is like when you said oh she saw a beam of light and all this business and her husband and her son were like in a trance my first thought was like i wonder if they put that trance in like a wide circle so that people don't see the uh... beam of light on her house don't hear the trees like i wonder how broadly this like trance goes that maybe it's the whole area or if the beam itself is what's putting people on a trance or that it hits oh, your location right because right? like if hit- she walked into the house maybe it was like then she got yeah. taken over Ooh. well so we end up finding out why because uh she morgan also by the way as this is happening and he's bleeding profusely just to make a, a mother's worst nightmare even worse he was not waking up during any of this so she didn't even know like if this was the, like it for him oh my god so it's almost like he was still in this trance of like not knowing what was going on he was like this this unwakeable sleep and uh but come morning he wakes up and he's totally fucking fine even asks to go to school um, covered in blood <laughs> covered in blood well i'm sure she wiped him off but yeah I don't, oh, just nightmare fuel when he came home from school laura asked him hey do you remember anything about last night and he said that he quote 
woke up and saw a skeleton man standing in his room. So he hid, he hid under his bed, but then he was taken out of his house along with the neighbor's son, who was the same age. Oh shit. So it's not just Morgan. It's the neighborhood boy is also being beamed up at the same time. (gasps) And they're both five. So that makes me think, unless the neighbors also have some sort of history with aliens, maybe it's like a compare and contrast situation. Where Interesting. It's like, um, here's a random five-year-old next door to the one that we- control sample. <laughs> here's a control sample next to our longitudinal study um, <gasps> of generational abduction something. I don't know. So, wow. they, so that would explain why the neighbor woman was also in a trance That's because crazy. her own kid- That was her kid. Oh, fuck. So even her own house was put under a trance. So both kids could be abducted and nobody noticed. And then that makes me think like, how connected is Laura? Because that mom was able to like be in a complete trance and taken over by them. But they allowed Laura to stay awake and conscious during all of this. And they even told her like, go help your son. Like they, they gave, they gave her a head start. Well, maybe they fucked up. Maybe they were like testing him and they accidentally like, poked him too hard or something and they were like "Uh oh that wasn't the plan hadn't even thought of that i wonder if i wonder if they planned on shutting off like her access to them once they had like a new generation to follow up with so without getting totally into it with wandavision there's a there's a new superhero where basically she was affected by wanda's magic so many times that her genes started mutating and she became she wasn't vulnerable to wanda's magic anymore like it wasn't affecting her the same way it was affecting everyone else because she had been hit by wanda's powers so many times and so i'm wondering if like laura had had so much access with the aliens over time that she was almost like impervious to their putting the, the moms under a trance while working on their kids Oh my God. You know, yes. or maybe they just, they like her after all this time. They're like, she's not that bad. Let's like let yeah. her be involved. Or maybe they just see her as one of them and are like, oh, she's yeah. too far gone. <laughs> if they genetically think that she is part alien, then technically her son would have like an, an aunt who's an alien up there just hanging out, you know? Yes, true. The little gray girl. When she realized that her son had been talking to somebody and was floating around outside of their house. Laura looked at the sky and thought really loudly. It's bad enough that you have taken me against my will all my life, but stay away from my kids. (gasps) And after that, I don't think anything happened to Morgan. I know she went to like, she took him to a doctor the next day and they couldn't find anything that was wrong with them. Of course. I don't know what happened to Morgan after that, but Laura had two more kids after Morgan and Rachel. She had Ashley and Ricky. And she says that she's always felt like they were watching her. And she's even had UFO sightings that where at times when she saw the UFO sighting, I, if I'm reading it right, or if I'm understanding her, it feels like she has enough paranoia now where if she has what she considers a UFO sighting, she wonders if she actually just had been abducted and doesn't fucking remember it. Like <gasps> true. Like her complete memory would have just, just been wiped, wiped the memory. Yeah. So anyway, she says that she's seen things, but nothing really drastic has happened to her again. And uh, it seems like since at least the 80s, she was telling them, like, stay away from my kids. And they listened. But (laughs) what I mean, it just couldn't be more perfect timing. It's like the aliens really want to fuck with us because after 1984 or whatever, she didn't have any really notable experiences until March 2020. (laughs) no shut up the beginning of the lockdown Come on. so laura was 62 and uh she heard strange humming as she was falling asleep no and i think at that point after like once you're 62 maybe you're just hardened from some of the shit that you went through as a kid and she just fucking ignored it she was like i don't even want to fucking know no. <laughs> so at this point what are you gonna do i mean you can't stop it There is a quote from her. This is a a longer one, but it's kind of ties everything together. Uh, But she heard humming uh, is where we end with that. She fell asleep listening to some strange humming over her house. And when asked about it, she said, I was very tired, so I didn't think anything of it and never got up to look outside. But last night, my daughter, Rachel, sent me a message to call her right away. (gasps) 
keep in mind, Rachel might be the one that has some alien DNA if <gasps> if our theory might be correct. Yes. So it's interesting that maybe Morgan's not being touched, but Rachel is, or some of the kids are more affected than the others. Oh, I don't shit. know about Ashley and Ricky, but Rachel is having experiences, which would also make it more credible that maybe Laura's mom did know more than she let on. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. now that's three generations that we know of. And four generations because Uh Rachel sent me a message to call her right away. She said my granddaughter Claire (gasps) was the last one eating at the table last night and she noticed a humming sound and saw a black ball hovering outside her window. And they live two houses away from (gasps) Laura. Oh no. So whatever humming Laura heard, Claire was also seeing. Oh no. My son-in-law said that he'd seen it the night before. They said it was humming or They said it was all black and round about four to six feet across and it had no visible lights. They saw it hovering over a stump of a giant pine tree they had just cut down and it also went over their neighbor's yard behind that house and came back to their yard. I'm guessing it may have been outside my house two nights ago when I heard the humming, which was the same night that they saw it. We live two doors away from each other and also my son-in-law just told me that the night he saw it, he was napping on the couch and woke up with their dog staring out the window and growling a low growl and usually she barks loudly at everything. So he turned to see what she was looking at and outside the window saw the black ball above the tree stump. It hovered very slowly towards him and as soon as it got a few feet away from his window, it triggered the outside floodlights to come on. (gasps) So he got a good look at it, but when their dog came in the room, the thing took off fast. So now two generations under Laura are experiencing things. And the person who wrote this article did vouch for Laura saying that she seemed very collected and articulate and very convinced of her past. And that Laura also was telling the story purely to tell her story and get it out there. Um, Not for any monetary reasons, but just because she wanted people to hear about it. I'm going to end on the creepiest thing to me is that very, very, very late in the game, decades later after everything happened, and I guess Laura was more open about her experiences, her sister Barbara came out and said, I was awake when I was floating down the stairs with you. Shut the front door. And we don't know anything else. Barbara, we need... We need more info, Babs. Come on. We can't. Barbie, <laughs> step it up. This is your time to tell us what the hell is going on. All we know is decades later, she admitted that she was awake during the incident all those years that ago. That moment where Barbara's like, I have to tell you something. Mm-hmm. In their 60s, they're drinking lemonade on the porch. <laughs> the hotty toddies. Hotty toddies, obviously. Sorry, hot toddies. Hot toddies. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, yeah, they're drinking on the porch, rocking back and forth. The movie ends. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have to tell you something. Oh, so scary. Which so means scary. I guess that means Barbara can confirm that happened, but I don't know. It, it, that's all the witness. info we got. Just another witness. So you've got a potential mom. You've got the sister. You've got Laura. You've got this genetic sister in space. You've got Morgan, who's had an experience. You've got Rachel and Rachel's granddaughter and Rachel's husband. So that's eight people that have been affected by these aliens, oh, not including be, those neighbors. To be a fly on the wall at that family reunion. Wow. I would pay big bucks to see this go down. Wow. Anyway, that was a, a long one, but that was the abductions of Laura Clark and Laura slash Rachel slash Claire, because you're probably within our podcast listenership audience demographic. demographics. <laughs> If you happen to be able to confirm any of this, please let me know. Wow. Uh, that is honestly one of the scarier ones you've told. I, as everyone knows, am terrified of aliens. Terrified. Yeah. Fully believe yeah. shit happens. And I want to, it's like, I want to, I'm fascinated. So I want to learn more, but I also have that weird theory that like the more you think and talk about it, the more I likely know. it is to be your, for you to be a part of it. So I don't know where I stand, but yikes. I know, I know you, we've mentioned it a million times, but like the, the only thing scarier about it is that potentially to think about it is, is going to get you in more dangerous. I know. Ooh, yikes. Okay. Well, thank you for terrifying me. Um, I'm going to go to bed tonight and like fucking safety pin my covers onto myself. I was going to say duct tape yourself into bed. (laughs) I swear that was the weirdest feeling. And I remember thinking like, 
something's off and then all of a sudden my covers got yanked Ugh. oh god I don't envy you that's I, awful. it's never I've never had something like physically like that aggressive happen um no, I don't like it. I don't envy you. I'm sorry that <laughs> happened though. I don't know how to help also, which is one of the reasons I feel so bad. Cause I'm like, if I could staple you into your mattress, I, I know you'd staple you know, me in. At, yeah. Read me I'll a bedtime just, story, staple me in. And then I'll tickle you while you're, while you're locked in. I'll Please get your don't. Window. That's <laughs> maybe worse than an alien abduction. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> Canva Pro is the easy to use design platform that is everything you need to design like a pro. Whether you're a professional designer or just getting started, Canva Pro can help boost you and your team's productivity and creativity. It's a quick, easy, and affordable way to design whatever you need. We've used Canva since the early, early days of, and that's why we drink. I mean, like day one when we really, I was talking about amateur. I had no idea what I was doing. And I made like all our thank you notes for patrons. I made everything on Canva and I still use them to this day because it is my favorite design platform. They have everything you need in one place, including a collection of over 75 million premium photos, videos, audio, and graphics. I mean, it's endless. I use it for truly every design. All our patron cards I sent out like once or twice a year, all made on Canva. Plus Canva Pro comes with time-saving tools that simplify and speed up the creative process. You get all this and more in just one Canva Pro subscription. So no matter what level you're at, you could be me and Christine at the very <laughs> beginning, or you could be like a super duper expert. Design like a pro with Canva Pro. Right now you can get a free 45 day extended trial when you use our promo code. Just go to canva.me slash ATWWD to get your free 45 day extended trial. That's C-A-N-V-A dot M-E slash ATWWD. Canva.me slash ATWWD. We just did the laundry over here, Christine. Congratulations. It's getting pretty <laughs> wild over here at Casa de Moi which is Spanish and French. Yeah, beautiful. And uh, I just threw some new pillowcases on and guess where they're from? Brooklyn. Oh, I, I know they're from Brooklyn because you and I both share that in common, our deep adoration for Brooklyn and bedding. They look so, I say it every time, but so swanky. Uh -huh. I Every time I walk into my bedroom, I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, look at <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> I I feel like an adult. So they do create beautiful, high quality bedding and home essential. They work right with manufacturers to give you a fair price. No middlemen, no markups. And their comforters come in lightweight, all season and ultra warm. So no matter what kind of sleeper you are, if you run hot, if you run cold, they definitely have a comforter for you. If you're like M and me, you have maybe some anxiety. They have a weighted comforter for stress relief. Mm. Really excellent. Highly recommend that. Treat yourself to ultimate comfort with Brooklinen's comforter collection. Go to brooklinen.com and use promo code ATWWD and get $25 off with a minimum purchase of $100. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com and enter promo code ATWWD for $25 off with a minimum purchase of $100. That's brooklinen.com, promo code ATWWD. Okay, well, I have a story for you that is uh, probably even more horrifying. So I apologize, but here we are back in true crime world. I have a story for you today. It takes place in Cleveland. Hmm. massive trigger warnings uh for sexual assault rape Ooh. bad times bad times so just a big heads up that um i know i, I that happens in a lot of stories i cover but this is just a little more detailed than usual oh, shit. uh okay so on october 29th 2009 police arrived at anthony sowell's home so well so well it's spelled like sowell so but it's pronounced so well got it Anthony Sowell's home on Imperial Street in Cleveland, Ohio, with a warrant to arrest him for the rape of Latundra Billups. So this is October of 2009. When they arrived at the house, Anthony wasn't there, but police had enough reason to stay. They had found two bodies on the floor of his living room. Shit. In the basement, they saw a mound of dirt on top of the concrete flooring, and when they looked closer, they found four more bodies. Both buried in this shallow grave in the basement and in other crawl spaces throughout the house. Okay. Then they took the backyard, or they took to the backyard where they found three more bodies plus the remains of a fourth. Jesus Christ. Yeah. They also okay. found a human skull in a bucket inside the house, uh, which they lovingly showed without any warning on the Vice documentary. Very Vice oh. of them. Just fucking here it is. Just yeah. warning. Uh, okay. Which now brought the body count in his home to 11. <sighs> So Yikes. Okay. stop by to arrest him for a rape and find 11 bodies in his house. Wow. Yeah. Not a moment too soon. I don't know. I don't know I, how I'm that idiom works, but that sounds right. 
It feels like it's many moments too late though. It was That's certainly, sure. certainly too late. Yes. Yeah, so that I uh, can't deny that. So this is the story of the gruesome Cleveland Strangler. Anthony. Wait, Sowell. the Cleveland Strangler. I feel like I know that name. Yeah, it's a very famous serial killer. Okay. Well, there you have it. And you're going to know all about him in the next half hour. Yay. <laughs> Yay. So Anthony Sowell was born on August 19th, 1959 in East Cleveland, Ohio. He was one of seven children born to single mom, Claudia Garrison. And in this vice doc, uh, vice doc, in this vice documentary, <laughs> which is on YouTube, they really delve into the background of the area. I mean, I'm familiar with the same kind of dynamic uh, in Cleveland in the first half of the 20th century. A lot of black families moved to this part of Cleveland, East Cleveland from the South. But then in the 60s, uh, white families, you know, migrated to the suburbs and over time, the East Cleveland area saw, which had once been like beautiful and thriving, saw the influx of drugs, especially when crack cocaine kind of took the streets. Okay. And uh, this basically worked to just segregate the area further, keep it under the thumb of poverty. Mm. You know, it, it, this is one of those stories that just shows the drastic, you know, difference in, in uh, how cases are handled and that kind of thing. Right, 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 right. So after Sowell's sister passed away from a chronic illness, he was raised alongside her seven children as well. So basically, as a child, he was raised alongside his seven nieces and nephews. Cool. Got it. He was primarily raised by his mother, Claudia, and his maternal grandmother, Irene. And from a young age, Sowell was witness to abuse. So his nieces, Ramona and her twin, Leona, said that a family friend would force them to strip butt naked and electrical extension cords were used to bind and whip them. Holy shit. Yeah. And Anthony was actually not beaten. Like he wasn't part of that, but he was witness to it, which is also traumatic, obviously, that you would right. witness your nieces, you know, suffering through this. So although neighbor Katie Tab would say he was the kindest child you wanted to deal with, he was always very respectable. His family kind of had a different story. They remembered him being conniving from a young age. He would like drink his grandma's pepsi like when he was really little just which i was like okay well it's like okay i did that but not like yeah. her malt liquor or like vodka right like, you know some <laughs> maybe he was just like a prankster or like goofy i guess or... i don't know yeah i guess maybe he just kind of got on people's nerves or like push buttons yeah <laughs> he would drink his okay. grandmother's pepsi he would start fights and then he would blame leona his niece and then she would get punished so i mean oh. that much that that's more on the level that i was thinking of like got it not being a great uh, kid, he would, yeah. you know, get his nieces in trouble and just let them be punished for things that he did. So this side of him didn't really translate at school. So a staff member of his school, Kirk Junior High, would later remember Anthony was shy and skinny. He was a little quiet and never wanted to start a conversation. If you said hi, he would say hi. If you asked a question, he would answer it. He was friendly, sort of, in that he would smile whenever I looked in his direction. Um, he wasn't known to be a ladies' man. This is from the school's recollection. He'd okay. often become the target of constant teasing about his lack of sexual experience. He was basically bullied for being like not cool, not, you know, sure. uh, a ladies' man. It's yeah. just so weird to me, but okay. So this was the narrative at school that he was kind of a nerd, kind of shy, um, not cool or anything. But at home, there was a different story. So according to Leona, Sowell would regularly take her upstairs to a bedroom in the house when they were preteens and would rape her. Mm. She said it was happening almost every day. Fuck. And she tried to report the rapes to authorities, but no one believed her. Oh my God. Okay. And here we begin on this lovely journey of infuriating lack of reaction, lack of response okay. to, you know, reports of these crimes. So this is the beginning of it all. She would try to report the rapes to authorities. No one believed her. On January 24th, 1978, uh, Sowell was 19 and he reported for Marine Boot Camp at Paris Island, South Carolina. And so there were two reasons that we kind of speculate as to why he left and went to join the Marines. A, he didn't have enough credits to graduate from high school. And B, he had apparently gotten a fellow high school student pregnant and wanted nothing to do with it. So he peaced out. Jeez. Okay. So after boot camp, uh, Sowell re reported for basic training. 
And among kind of the courses or like the, the training he went through, he took courses such as basic chokes and basic weapons of opportunity. Perfect. Unfortunately, as you can probably guess, this becomes relevant later. Mm-hmm. So Sowell spent another month there learning electrical wiring. And okay. he was then assigned to the Marine Corps as an electrician. Uh-huh. So in 1980, at age 22, Sowell was sent to Okinawa, Japan. And upon returning, he actually married a fellow Marine, Kim Yvette Lawson. And this was in 1981. And he stayed in the Marines for about four more years before he left. And although the Marines said he went AWOL at like one point for two months, so that was obviously not cool, not something you're supposed to do. And although they said he had gone AWOL for two months at one point, Sergeant Sowell departed with a mountain of praise, including a rifle sharpshooter award, good conduct medal, a certificate of commendation, and two letters of appreciation. Wow. So. Okay. At this point, I'm fascinated because I'm like, there are like six different versions that we're getting of this guy from different viewpoints. Yeah, it's, see, I was going to say, it seems like we're not getting a f- I mean, we're getting a full story, but I don't know what- It what, doesn't like fit. Yeah. What's the right story or yeah, what's like the, yeah. what's the story that I should trust the most? Yeah. Like, it, it feels conflicting. Like all of it doesn't mm, add up somehow. Right, yeah. Right. No, that's how I felt as well. So he left the Marines with all this praise. Uh, and strangely that same year, Kim pretty much right after he left the Marines divorced him. So Kim later reflected that during their time in the Marines, Sowell was drinking excessively and Kim said she had married him to help him. She also, her daughter later explained that her mother didn't want him to get a dishonorable discharge. She was trying to get him through the Marine Corps and that's why she divorced him the day he got out. Oh, okay. So interesting. I don't, I mean, everyone has, I guess, reasons for what they do, but um, Clearly, yeah. there was a lot going on behind the scenes during their marriage. I, I mean, to the second he like takes off the uniform for the last time, you're like, here are your divorce papers. I'm fucking it's over it. It's not working anymore. Yeah, <laughs> I'm over it. I tried. Um, and, you know, the, the cliche of you can't change somebody, mm-hmm. you can't fix somebody. It's just like extra obvious here, I guess. Yeah. So in 1985, he had returned home to Cleveland, but the city was pretty much changed it was changed pretty radically from what it had been seven years before when he had last lived there so in 1985 when he was back a quarter of the population of east cleveland now lived below poverty level and 90 percent of the population were black which plays again into the treatment of this case and the handling by police Mm -hmm. and so it was also a time like i said when crack cocaine had taken kind of hold of the area Crack was sort of a new thing on the scene, a new smokable, potent form of cocaine. And with its introduction, crime rates rose drastically. There was now also a new subset of folks with addictions, um, which were sex workers who worked in exchange for crack cocaine. Mm -hmm. And that was something that hadn't, it was like a new phenomenon that that subset kind of hadn't existed before. Right. This is like a whole new angle to addiction, to crime, to, uh, you know, having to live on the streets, all that all that stuff. So kind of adds a picture or like yeah. more detail to the picture. Totally. So into this new kind of changed East Cleveland arrived 25 year old Sowell who had just served a seven year military regimen divorced after four years from a wife who had worried about his boozing and a man who, according to documents, court documents, was accused of ducking his responsibilities as the father of a now seven-year-old from the high school pregnancy he had (laughs) co-created. Got it. Okay. So that basically that child ended up being born and he was accused of abandoning his responsibilities in taking care of the child. Sure. So, so well went back to his heavy drinking. He would start drinking first thing in the morning and he became increasingly aggressive when he drank. And that serviced uh, in 1988 when police arrested Sowell on a charge of domestic violence against a woman whose name we actually don't know. He served eight days in jail. And as this was happening, meanwhile, in the background, terror was taking over East Cleveland. So in May of 1988, the body of 36-year-old Rosalind Garner was found in her home on Hayden Avenue. She had been strangled. 
Carmela Karen Prater, age 27, was found in an abandoned home on First Avenue on February 27th, 1989, so the year after, and the cause of her death is unknown. And then only a month later, on March 28th, the body of another woman named Mary Thomas, 27, was found near an abandoned building, also on First Avenue, and she had been strangled with a red ribbon. So Jesus, these all took place in less than a year. These three right in the same neighborhood, same area. And uh, I want to be clear here that has never been definitively, these murders have never been definitively linked to Sowell, but the MO kind of signifies that they could have been. Uh, it's implied, it's, it's suggested. Yeah, it's definitely some people, yeah, assume it was him, but there's definitely no outright proof. However, even if it wasn't him, um, it kind of gives you another insight into like the tension and the terror that was happening in the neighborhood. Even if sure these specific crimes weren't done by him, this was still happening in the neighborhood where he was living and operating. So just a bad time, just a bad time. Not good. Tough times, tough times. So while all of these murders were going on, uh, and even though we don't necessarily know whether they had been committed by Sowell, he was definitely guilty of another crime by this point in that he had raped a 21-year-old woman who was three months pregnant. She told her story to authorities four months after Mary Thomas's body was discovered. So basically, he was directly linked to this crime, and this was happening right in the midst of these other crimes. So just to give you an idea of like why some people believe that he was involved in the other three as well. Okay. So she told her story and this is what she told police on July 22nd, 1989. Sowell met her at a motel and told her that her boyfriend was waiting for her at Sowell's house about 500 yards away. So she went with him, entered the house and he threw her on his bed, choked her and raped her repeatedly. Uh, probably goes without saying, but her boyfriend was not at Sowell's house. It was obviously uh, mm. his ruse, his lie to get her into his home. And when she tried to leave, Sowell bound her hands with a necktie, cinched a belt around her feet, and stuffed a rag in her mouth. And thankfully, when Sowell, who had been drinking, fell asleep, she was able to wriggle free and escape out of a window. Jeez. Thank so, God. But yeah, still. I know. And it's like horrible because you in the documentaries, you see people retelling like the trauma of what happened and then there are so many people who didn't make it it's just it's really sick That's awful. um so a grand jury indicted so well for this case but he didn't show up for his court date so on december 8th the court issued an arrest warrant but he was nowhere to be found then seven months later and only four miles away another woman came forward saying so well raped her too so at 1 a.m on june 24th 1990 the 31-year-old woman told police she went to a house in Cleveland, uh, in East Cleveland. She sat behind, she sat beside Sowell on a love seat, and they started drinking, hanging out. Sowell then got up, came up behind her, and started choking her, mm. spewing a stream of obscene descriptions of sex acts, how and where he would violate her, and announcing oh that she was his bitch and she had better learn to like it. Oh my God gets worse here obviously of course it always does he dragged her upstairs by the neck uh he raped her orally vaginally and anally and even after the woman told him she was five months pregnant uh, and begged him to stop he instead forced her to say yes sir i like it <gasps> oh my god yeah. oh my god that's so terrible oh my god yeah it's an extra violating gruesome retelling today wow fuck that guy oh my god yeah and it's one of those things where you know i don't like to repeat it or say it but this was her testimony and the story that she want wants to tell on the documentaries in court um and so it's sort of like you know this is a story she wants told and uh yeah i feel no. like that's a small thing i can do is at least tell it how she wants it to be told I get um, so it, but I mean, wow. It's, it's just... really horrific, uh, and it's tough to say and think about, so I apologize if I'm ruining everyone's day, because I'm sure I am. So, <laughs> I'm so anyway. sorry. If, if, if she were to ever hear this, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Yeah, it's uh, it's really rough to watch them retell the stories in, in court and on the, in the interviews. It's very um, sobering and, and dark. Yeah. So... So well, after all this, he went to sleep 
and the woman was able to leave. And when she returned with police at 8 a.m., he was still sleeping. The police arrested him, but charges were never filed because they couldn't find the woman to testify. And this seems to become a pattern of letting Sowell go because women were either too traumatized or terrified to testify, or they were too scared to speak to police, or even though the evidence was right there in front of them. And so he was let go over and over again, Mm -hmm. which is just so infuriating. So the police finally, even though they weren't able to get, or they didn't get him on this charge, they had finally found him because he had gone missing when they originally, when the grand jury indicted him for that rape. So they finally had him for that. And Sowell was in jail awaiting trial on those charges. And he did eventually plead guilty to attempted rape, which okay. like, hey, not even bare minimum. And on September 12th, 1990, a judge sentenced him to 15 years in prison. And he actually remained in prison for uh, 15 years. And then in 2005, he was released. He was supposed to be clean and sober. A psychological evaluation deemed him unlikely to rape again. Uh, (laughs) Okay. Yeah. I think we can see where this is going. But he had to register as a sex offender and report to the Cuyahoga Cuyahoga County Sheriff's Office once a year. Not shockingly at all, he did not leave prison a changed man. He pretty much immediately began uh, targeting sex workers. Mm. So according to four women suffering from drug addictions who had encounters with Sowell, he would offer women malt liquor, companionship, and shelter from the dangers of the the streets on Cleveland's east side. So he basically took vulnerable people and offered them help and care, you know, and took advantage of that, basically. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm just like so no, I mean, bummed I? out. <laughs> I can't just, expect you to say anything. You know, it's like I'm just waiting say? for the next horrible thing to come out of your mouth. Christine. Yeah, it'll keep happening. It'll keep coming. Don't. Jesus. Okay. Sorry. I'm glad no, you, no. It's your glad job. you know. I'm glad you know what's what's coming here. <laughs> yeah. Just Yikes. worse and worse and worse until the end. Great. Um, he would offer them companionship, shelter, and then if he ever felt so, he was very kind to them until. If he ever felt betrayed by anyone he was trying to help, he would begin terrorizing, attacking, or raping them. Uh, Two women told police he would turn on them as quickly as he had befriended them. So like one wrong move and he would find an excuse to violate you or hurt you in some way. Jesus. Yeah. So out of prison, Sowell rented out space in the home of his uh, stepmother, his late father's widow, who was a stepmom. He started dating women who lived or hung out in the neighborhood, one of whom was Tanya Doss, who lived across the street from him. And at this time, uh, Tanya Doss said he did not use crack cocaine, but she and uh, Tone, she called Anthony Tone, drank beer, played chess, barbecued. He told Doss he had been in prison, but that he had served a crime committed by someone else. So she was under the impression that like he had been falsely accused and mm. he actually wasn't a criminal which obviously is the farthest thing from the truth he uh Doss, tanya Doss would later say he seemed like a regular human being so it really does seem like he's able to kind of dupe people uh, right throughout all of this which is like extra I mean, scary he seems very uh he's kind of got that weird killer charming Charm. thing yeah yeah like he's able to swindle you yeah yeah like yeah. make you feel comfortable with him it mm-hmm. just always adds like such an element of creepiness. It's just the the ability to so easily manipulate another person is mm-hmm. tr- really disturbing. And it makes it extra disgusting when it's like people who are suffering from drug addictions or poverty or need people help. Who, yeah, people who are already going through, like this is the last thing they fucking need. Yes, yeah. <laughs> they're like so vulnerable and you take advantage of that. It's just extra gross. Mm. Anyway, she was saying, I thought he was just a normal guy. I never knew all this had been going on. And it was around this time that Sowell began dating a woman named Lori Frazier. So interestingly enough, Lori was actually the niece of Cleveland's mayor, Frank Jackson. So he climbed his way to, I don't know, local politics. politics. (laughs) Great. Yeah, great. So he and Lori dated until around 2007, 2008. Um, and Lori Frazier even remembered later, he took good care of me, good care of me. So according to Tanya Doss, Frazier and Sowell lived together in what looked like a 
normal, quote unquote, normal, you know, she already said he seemed like a regular guy, monogamous relationship. Uh, it seemed as if Frazier actually might have been leading him down a life of more stability. He got a job uh, as a rubber molder at a place called Custom Rubber Corp. Interesting. And, yeah. And if you don't think of that as like a, I don't know, a thing, but I guess someone has to mold the rubber. Oh, well, I, that's like, that was the the room I always wanted to work in at ISS. I've oh, always, I interesting. Always, they would call it the rubber room. I was like, oh, damn, I always wanted to work in the rubber room. <laughs> Isn't rubber room also like a, what you say about an insane asylum or whatever, those old timey. Oh, I don't know. I never, I only knew it as like the room where you make rubber. <laughs> So. Let me see. Uh, I would have thought it would be like a like a like a a leather sex dungeon. Well, I, guess. <laughs> I don't know why, because rubber and leather. Are oh, not here the we same go. Thing. Yeah, ru- uh, rubber room, informal, a room padded with foam rubber for the confinement of a violent, mentally ill person. That's what oh, they used to. Yikes! Yeah, that's Never what mind. They used to call in the old timey quote unquote like um, insane asylums where they had the white room padded uh, rooms were called rubber i had rooms. no idea i really just thought it was because we made fucking rubber i <laughs> i'm so stupid uh, no i mean it's i think it's like a i don't think it's like an official term or anything but well hopefully um, that's not uh, offensive to anybody i really just thought like oh the room where we make rubber obviously it'd be called the rubber room so <laughs> i mean it makes um, some sense <laughs> but no it's it's that's like the only redeeming redeeming quality thus far about him is that I always wanted to be a rubber molder when I worked at ISS. So. And that's the last good thing I'll say so about sweet. him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so he worked at this rubber company molding rubber and the president Charlie Braun later recalled that he was a very good employee. So again, just like a conflicting outlook from a different person in his life. Right. So his girlfriend, Lori Frazier, everything to her seemed pretty positive until 2007 when his personal and work lives started to kind of unravel and simultaneously women on or near Imperial Avenue where he lived began to go missing. This all started with Crystal Dozier. She was a 35 year old mother of seven who went missing on May 17, 2007. In July, 2007, after So Well didn't show up for work two days in a row, he was fired by Custom Rubber Products Corp. And mm. suddenly he didn't have a steady job. So his means of self, self-support drastically changed. He began collecting and selling scrap metal and collecting unemployment benefits. And once those checks started rolling in, he was using them to buy crack cocaine. And that is where his uh, addiction began. So he had not been using crack cocaine until now. Got it. Okay. So it was also around this time that Sowell's next door neighbor, Councilman Zach Reed, I'm like, I don't know where all these council people and politicians are suddenly like welcoming him with warm arms, like (laughs) open arms. Yeah. So it's just strange how he's suddenly surrounded by all these like politicians. But so local councilman Zach Reed, uh, his next door neighbor, first complained right around this time about a horrible odor that permeated the street uh, of Imperial. Oh, God. Okay. Well, I, I, think I could bet money on what that smell is. It was the rubber room. No, it was not. The rubber room. <laughs> uh, I wish it was, but it's not. So at first nobody thought much of it. And uh, because it was a lower economic area and complaints simply were not given the attention they deserved there, it just kind of largely went ignored. So no mm. matter how many times people would complain, people dismissed it, you know, authorities dismissed it. And it just kind of became a nuisance that people just had to deal with. So in late 07, early 2008, Sowell ended a nearly three-year relationship with Lori Frazier. And in retrospect, Lori claims to have smelled the stench of what she thought, she kind of realized later, like, I think that was a smell of decaying bodies. That was like her gut instinct. Yeah, but Lori, I think so. <laughs> Lori, I think you're onto something. But yeah. Sowell told her, no, that's just the smell coming from my stepmother. <gasps> Oh my God. She smelled like a dead fucking body. That I really, I literally wrote in my notes. It gives new meaning <laughs> to that phrase. She smelled, don't worry. My stepmother, just poor stepmother, leave her out of this. She still smells like a dead fucking body. Can you imagine hearing that in hindsight and being like, what the fuck did I do? Like yeah. what? How, how I how let did you I get, live in my house. <laughs> how did I get dragged into this? What was going on? It's awful. And so that's what he like insisted was happening. And when Lori moved out, she dismissed it basically as coming from uh, 
the neighboring sausage shop. There was a place called Ray's Sausage Shop next door. Ooh. And I'm thinking, shouldn't he just have used that as an excuse? It's a better excuse than yeah. it's my stepmom. Like to say, I live next door to a literal sausage shop. Like you could to say, say that. I'm, I'm, I live next to a place that probably has some rotten meat in their Dead dumpster meat. or something. Like, <laughs> And not like, oh, my stepmom smells like the sausage factory after a <laughs> bad batch. Yeah, it's so just extra rude. Like, it's so not important, but like so rude. Um, Yikes. <laughs> it is so, so rude. Yeah. So Lori was like, yeah, he was telling me all these things and I just kind of dismissed it. But uh, as we probably know, Lori's first instinct had actually been correct. Mm -hmm. So it would not come as a surprise to any of us that more women around this time went missing. Mm. So Tashana Culver was last seen in June of 2008. She was 33 years old and she had drifted in and out of, of her family's life so often that it had gotten to the point where they stopped reporting her missing, which is just extra sad because at a certain point, they just assumed she would come back and she never did. Uh, so sad. It is. It's really, really, really sad. And then there was LaShonda Long, who was last seen August 08. She was 17. And at the age of 17, she had three kids, but was deemed unfit to raise them. And she, at 17, was the youngest of all of Sowell's victims. Jesus. Yikes. Okay. Then there was Michelle Mason, who was last seen in October of 08. Before she went missing, the 45-year-old had experienced a pretty like triumphant kind of comeback period in her life. She had mm. kicked her heroin and crack addictions. She was living independently. She hadn't been arrested in years. Like she was very proud of having turned her life around. Then she, you know, became a victim awful. of Sowell's. None of it's happy, but I no. mean, just like, <laughs> I have nothing else to say. I like, I'm just like, yikes every time. It's just, just yikes, TM, TM, the entire story. <clears throat> yes. Um, and then there was Tonya Carmichael, who's 53 and was last seen November 10th, 08. And although these women going missing weren't linked to Sowell yet, uh, there were other cases at the time that were clearly linked to him, but how fun were being fully dismissed by police. Right. So here's an example. On December 8th, 2008, a bleeding woman literally runs up to a police car and tells police that Anthony Sowell asked her if she wanted to have a beer with him. And when she said no, he punched her, choked her, and tried to rip off her clothes. Oh my God. Police went to Sowell's home, arrested him. However, police later said no charges were filed because the woman didn't want to talk to detectives. Oh my God. I'm like, okay. she's covered in blood. She already told you what happened. I understand like it would be helpful to have somebody re like, you know, recount things, but like this person has been traumatized, probably doesn't have a great experience with police for obvious reasons. And now you're demanding she like walk you through this all over again. It's, it's just infuriating how often this guy just gets off the hook because, because of yeah. situations like this. Yeah. So, however, while these women were being attacked and uh, some obviously murdered tragically, in the meantime, Soel had joined an online dating service. And uh, his biography on the website revealed, like his profile, revealed that he was a master looking for a submissive person to train, which like, that's not what you're doing. <laughs> like, no. that's not what this is. Like, that is Especially, not. Especially, like, the other, that one really 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 extra awful one earlier when he like went up behind someone and said like yeah it like, was really demeaning to her and yeah. like that was not a consensual experience no no, no no yeah like you're making not looking... it come off as like a bdsm partnership and it's like that's not what any of yeah this it's been. really fucking insulting to the bdsm yeah, it is. community it i is. mean i i can't imagine like the only time you're ever anyone's ever hearing about this kind of stuff is just through like serial killers i mean Anyways, just an extra kick in the crush to them. But okay, so he is full blown lying. But yeah, he's making up on. some excuse as to what he's doing. Did and he? Do we know if he legitimately thought that he was doing that? Or no, I don't was... think so. I think he just was okay. trying to find a way to like get people to come over. He was always like okay. making up lies about like, hey, I have beer. Hey, I have shelter for you. Hey, I have. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah. Okay. I just, you know I can't just say wanted for to sure, but... just wanted to confirm that he what knew what he was up to but also i'm assuming he knew what he was up to master uh, manipulator so yeah so meanwhile his house was the site of regular neighborly cookouts neighbors would come to play chess and drink together and hang out and during these party months two women came forward saying they had gone to his place for a good time but then things turned violent one of the women was tanya das his across the street mm. neighbor who he had dated for a while 
And she would later say in interviews and to police that Sowell attacked her on April 21st of 09, saying he slapped her, choked her, and forced her to strip naked after he ran out of crack. She curled up on a bed, and eventually he left her alone, and she was able to get away. And it was around this time that Sowell also started using alcohol, alcohol and drugs to lure women with criminal pasts to his house. So Ooh. typically these encounters began unthreateningly, but they would turn violent once the beer and drugs ran out, or if they asked him any question that he thought was he didn't like, or, you know, any, I mean, anything, found, anything, anything, you're not anything. safe, right? Like there's nothing, you're not doing anything wrong. He's just picking and choosing some reason. He, he to... could very well just been like, I don't like your fucking face. And exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So he was just kind of finding any excuse to, you know, go off the rails. Uh, on September 22nd of 09, Sowell persuades a woman named Latundra Billups to come over, but he becomes angry. He hits her, chokes her and rapes her as she passes out. Fortunately, she is able to get away after promising him $50. She said, I'm going to go get $50. I'll bring it to you. And I won't tell police about the incident. Of course, he lets her go and she goes to police to tell her about, tell them about the incident. Okay, good. Yeah. However, uh, progress with the case was slow because according to police, the victim was difficult to reach. Oh my God. I don't even know what that means. Are you? What? Yeah. Okay. Next. It just is so easily, all of these are so easily dismissed and this is, I mean, how many times has somebody come up to police and said, this guy has raped me? And it's like, well, let him I go wonder... home again. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's infuriating. During this time, however, on October 20th, 09, an ambulance is sent to Sowell's house after neighbors called 911 to report a naked woman falling from a second story window. Sowell mm. tells rescue workers he and the woman had been doing drugs and that she accidentally fell out of the window. But EMS takes the woman to the hospital and calls police who go to his home, but Sowell has fled. He is not there. Convenient. Very convenient. Police then go to the hospital uh, where the woman refuses to talk to investigators. And then nine days later, October 29th, police finally get a warrant. They enter Sowell's house. And this is when all of this comes full circle to the beginning of these notes. As we had already covered in 07, one woman had gone missing. In 08, four women had disappeared. And then throughout 09, Sowell had murdered another six women. Oof. So all wow. of this kind of culminates in there, you know, finally making it into his home and seeing the carnage and everything that he's done. Some of the women that he had murdered, the six women that he had murdered throughout 2009, six in one year, are... As follows, Kim Y. Smith was last seen January 17th of 09. She never married. She was actually the only one of his 11 victims who didn't have children. And Ugh. friends described her as the artsy type. Then there was Nancy Cobbs, 44, who was last seen on April 24th, 09. Before she developed an addiction to drugs, she had been an active mother of three children. Amy Hunter was last seen in spring of 09. And in her final years, according to her family, she had felt overcome by life's troubles and had sort of retreated into a, a house near where Sowell lived. Then there was Janice Webb, who was last seen in, in June of 09. And before 48-year-old Janice had developed her uh, crack cocaine addiction, she was known as the family jokester. She loved to pull pranks and she loved being with family. And then there was Talisha Fortson, who was last seen on June 3rd of 09. Her biological mother struggled with a drug addiction and her father suffered from alcoholism, according to friends. And she had already kind of had a tough life and was a mother of three and was found dead at only 31 years old. And finally, there was Diane Turner, who was last heard from in September of 2009. She was 38 and she was the last of the victims to go missing and her remains lingered unidentified in the Cuyahoga County Coroner's office the longest. Uh, it took more than a month to confirm her identity because she had been so removed from her family like her connections with her family were pretty tattered and so it took them a while to find someone to identify the body so all of these women's bodies all of the above were found that one day in anthony sowell's house either in the house or buried nearby in the backyard in shallow graves and just as a refresher that means they found 11 bodies on his wow. property that day and this is in addition to all of the women who had escaped and you know Jeez. said they had been raped and attacked so the 11 were just the ones that he had murdered and oh that, God. you know, wow. isn't even part of the bigger, or that's only a part of the bigger count of his crimes. So two days later, October 31st, he, they finally found and arrested Sowell. 
he was charged with 85 counts of murder, rape, and kidnapping. Wow. I know. It's like when you hear it all kind of together, like 11 bodies. And I mean, it's just outrageous. Oh my God. He pleaded, first he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, but then he later changed his plea to simply not guilty. Okay. On July 22nd of 2011, he was convicted on all but two counts against him, including the murders of the 11 women whose bodies were found in his house. And on August 10th, jurors recommended the death penalty. And on August 12th, the judge upheld this recommendation for the death penalty. However, so he had served 10 years until last month, February of 2021, when he died of an undisclosed terminal illness. Okay. So as he was on death row, uh, He he served 10 years and he died last month. So it's kind of coming oh, back wow. into the news a little bit um, because of his death. Got it. Okay. But wow. that is the story. It is heinous, horrendous. There are a couple documentaries. Uh, if you're interested, there is the one I mentioned, uh, the Vice documentary. And it, it, that one's good because, I mean, I really like that one because the guy who covers it talks about how he grew up in Cleveland. He's black. His parents were police officers during this time. And so he has a very like unique connection to the area to the families that the time the time the families that um even the police investigation because he you know has family in the force so it's very interesting like how he gets to approach it from such a personal standpoint um so I really like that it's on YouTube it's called the Cleveland Strangler I was gonna say I really I always love a good vice documentary they do them so well I know they do. And like, I know they get a bad rap and sometimes I like, it's just like an eye roll. Cause they're like, we're so edgy. Yeah. Um, but I think like this, they do have a, a great team of, you know, editors and researchers and this was definitely really well done. And so I definitely recommend, and you know, he talks one-on-one a lot with the kids and parents and friends of the victims, which is really cool to see, like, just like to humanize them a bit, you know, because obviously we see victims like who are sex workers who have drug addictions and oftentimes by the media, they get kind of lumped into just kind of a dismissed group who aren't taken as seriously. It's, it's cool to be able to see, you know, their backgrounds, their families and learn more about them. So there's that. And there's also one called unseen. So definitely if you want to learn more, check it out. Wow. That was a really heavy one, but it's a lot. Yeah. My bad. (laughs) No, I mean, needed to be told, but wow, that was, that was a tall order. Yeah, Um, that's a a roughie. Uh, That was, you know, one of the worst serial killers in Cleveland history. Well, I'm glad I didn't tell that at our Cleveland show. Can you imagine? And I told the torso killer and like, obviously that was heinous, but like, yeah, thank God I didn't do this one. (laughs) Thank God when, you know, we pick up live shows again, we are not trying to tell horrific stories yes. on stage and then expect positive Cheers. reactions yeah yeah Ugh, yeah, yeah what exactly. a time that was oh uh, my gosh anyway so i don't that's know that's that on that's that. that thanks for uh, listening thank you and you can check out all of our stuff at and that's why you can follow our socials our it's atwd podcast please follow our patreon um always good stuff there and as of tomorrow christina and i are opening Many, many, many fan mail packages. Oh, and I'm so excited. We're finally getting to them over Zoom. So we're uh, just uh, just a note that we are, those will be up soon on Patreon. So. Yes. And uh, Eva and Jess have come up with some really fun stuff that they do. I mean, there's obviously the Patreon newsletter, uh, which is really fun and has some like fun perks and stuff. And then on Patreon as well, we're doing uh, on Wednesdays, we're doing like alternate titles to episodes that Eva came up with but that didn't get picked um and people can like vote on their favorites or add their own titles they come up with which I always have a really fun time reading and then uh every Saturday now Em and I are giving three clues about the next day's topic to see if anyone can guess kind of what we're covering so a lot of fun stuff happening sneak peek Saturdays as I'm I'm trying to coin it but I think that's uh, I think that's what it's called so good job Thank you. Well, do you want to shout out those um, places people can donate again? Oh, absolutely. Again? Great idea. And then we will also put um, put those in the show notes as well. Oops. Sorry. One second. Sorry. I know you probably already closed out of your notes, but. I don't know why. I never do that. And today I think I was just like overwhelmed and I just hit like quit, quit <laughs> pages, quit. Please escape. Please, <laughs> escape. I must. Escape, escape, escape. Uh, so yes, I will definitely. Uh, 
oh wait this is not this is my beach to sandy notes it's this bagel <laughs> shop so i was like what we get it christine also has a show called beach to sandy go listen to it and none of them are well <laughs> uh organized or you know professionally <laughs> monitored or taken care of okay so here we go here are a couple sources um in my long rant there is the asians americans advancing justice uh, asian americans advancing justice fund in atlanta that has a fund um dedicated to helping people in the Atlanta area, Asian Americans in the Atlantic area, as well as the Community Action Fund, which is set up by Hate is a Virus. Um, and you can donate to both of those. They're still trying to reach their goal. So definitely worth checking out. There are also several GoFundMes. I think GoFundMe actually has created their own fund called like Stop Asian Hate. That uh, is definitely worth checking out. And then a website that I really recommend and that I've bookmarked myself is called stopaapihate.com. And there you can uh, not only learn more about the movement, but also report any hate incidents you might witness or, um, you know, see in your day-to-day -day life that are, that need to be spoken up about. So we'll put that in the show notes, but otherwise, um, thanks for, you know, listening and checking that out and let's see, let's do what, what we can do for yeah. the world. Cause it needs some help, a lot of help. All right, everyone. Now and I'm putting escape, escape. And <laughs> that's <laughs> why we escape. I was trying to escape the show. It wouldn't let me out. <laughs> Drink. <laughs>